Ben bir ekleme yapabilir miyim? Tabii buyurun. Atilla Hocam merhaba. Ee, merhaba hocam. 1941 tarihli Türk Tarih Kurumu'nda e, basılan basıl, basılacağı haber verilen e, eserler hakkında bilgi verdiniz. Asar, Bakiye ve Kanun Suriyaziyat. Ee, bunun şüpheli olduğunu e, söylediniz. Bunu şöyle belki teyit edebiliriz. Hasan Ali Yücel 1940'larda Kültür Bakanlığı yaptı biliyorsunuz. Hı hı. Ee, 1950'lerde hı hı. yazdığı e, bir şey maka, e, anma yazısında Salih Zeki adına yazdığı bir anma yazısında e, ben bakanken e, kamus riyaziyatı bastırmak istedim ancak muvaffak başarılı olamadım hmm. diyor. Demek ki e, hani evet. haber de bunu teyit ediyorsa muhtemelen gerçekten zaten söylediğine göre Kültür Bakanı olarak yetki vermiş ancak e, hatta hmm. on, il, ilginç bir ifadesi var. E, Zeki gibi çalışkan ve hem doğuyu hem batıyı beraber ele alabilecek bir alim olma, bulamadığımız için e, çalışma yarım kaldı yapılamadı gibi bir serzenişi evet, evet. var. Doğru e, zaten aslında 50'lerden 60'lardan sonra da biliyorsunuz Süheyl Ünver'in bir çabası var 60'larda. Asar-ı Baki'ye en son bir e, daktörüsüyle tercüme ediliyor ama sonuçta basılamıyor. Evet evet evet. Teşekkür ederim hocam. Katkınız için sağ olun. Başka yorum veya soru var mı? Peki. Teşekkür ederiz. İkinci evet, konuşmamıza ederim. geçebiliriz. Kapatıyorum İkinci konu... Evet lütfen. Gerekiyor. İkinci konuşmacımız Sayın Alper Atasoy. Tarihi bilim üzerinden okumak Salih Zeki Bey'in bilim tarihi anlayışı adlı tebliğini sunacak. Buyurun. Merhabalar. Bu sene Salih Zeki Bey'in 100. ölüm yıl dönümü olduğu için kendisi adına anmak birçok anma toplantısı yapıldı. Salih Zeki kimdir? Kendisini ilk Türk modern bilim tarihçisi olarak kabul ediyoruz. Aynı zamanda bir eğitimci, mantıkçı, bilim filozofu diyebiliriz, bir düşünür diyebiliriz. Ve kendi döneminin en etkin entelektüellerinden biri. Osmanlı son döneminin, ikinci meşrutiyet döneminin, 20. yüzyıl başlarının en önemli kişiliklerinden birisi. Atilla Bey ile anlattığımız bazı noktalar çakışıyor ancak ben hani doğrudan onun anlattıklarıyla çakışmamak üzere gene aynı çerçevede bir sunum yapacağım. Sunumumun ana konusu Salih Zeki Bey'in 19. yüzyıl, 20. yüzyıl Osmanlı bilim tarihi yazıcılığına getirdiği yenilikler. Sunum planım önce ortaya problemi tanıtacağız. Salih Zeki'nin hayatı ve çalışmalarına Atilla Bey de bazı noktalarda değindi ama ben çok kısa olarak hem tanıtma amaçlı hem kendini anma amacıyla çok kısa olarak hayatını anlatacağım. Sunumda Yunan, İslam ve Batı bilim tarihi yazıcılığı geleneği de almıştım. Buraya da plana koymuşum ama bu konu genelde bilim tarihçileri tarafından bilindiği için orayı geçeceğim. Hem de süreyi daha verimli kullanmak adına. Osmanlı bilim tarihi yazıcılığı denemeleri 18. ve 19. pardon 19. ve 20. yüzyılda e, bu geleneği inceleyip Salih Zeki'nin bu geleneğe getirdiği yenilikleri incelemeye çalışacağız. Bu amaçla ortaya koyduğumuz problem Salih Zeki Bey'in ilk Türk bilim tarihçisi sayılması, sadece bu alanda ilk Türkçe eserleri yazması nedeniyle mi yoksa bir araştırma yöntemi bakımından getirdiği yenilik mi dayanmaktadır? İki, Salih Zeki bilim ve tarih ilişkisini nasıl kurar? Üçüncüsü Salih Zeki'nin medeniyet tasavvuru, medeniyet düşüncesi, kavrayışı nedir? Kısaca tanıtmak gerekirse Salih Zeki Bey 1864 yılında İstanbul'da doğdu. Küçük yaşta annesi ve babasını kaybettiği için yetim çocukların eğitim gördüğü dönemin en önemli eğitim kurumlarından biri olan Darüşşafaka'da da okudu. 1882 yılında buradan mezun oldu. Darüşşafaka'nın önemi şu. Son sınıfında öğrencilere, yetim çocuklara bir meslek kazanmak için son senelerinde otomatik şey, makine, elektrik, telgrafçılık, muhasebe, mevzuat, kanunlar gibi idari ve mesleki dersler verilmesi. Salih Zeki de hem, hem dönemin e, popüler mesleklerinden biri olması hem de hocalarının yönlendirmesiyle telgrafçılık mesleğini seçer ve o dönemin Osmanlı Posta ve Telgraf Bakanlığı'nda yani nezaretinde çalışmaya başlar. Burada gösterdiği başarılı çalışmalarla Paris'e eğitime, elektrik mühendisliği eğitime gönderilir. Zannediyoruz gönderildiği okul kesin bir kayıt olmamakla birlikte Ecole de Superior de Telegrafi 
Telgrafçılık Yüksek Okulu dediğimiz Paris'teki bir okul. 1885-86 yılında yurda döner ve bakanlıktaki görevine mühendis olarak devam eder. Çeşitli eğitim kurumlarında matematik ve fizik üzerine dersler verir. 1889 yılında ilk makalesi Memoir sur le chiffre indien Hint rakamları üzerine bir araştırma isimli Fransızca makalesini kaleme alır. Ancak bu makalenin hangi künyede yayınladığı şu an bilinmiyor. Sadece Asarı Bakiye isimli eserinde bir referans gösterilmiş. Muhtemelen e, el yazması olarak kaldı ve basılmadı. Yine de e, referans gösterdi diye düşünüyoruz. E, 1887-1892 yılları arasında 5 sene boyunca bilim tarihi araştırmalarına e, araştırmalarında bulundu. Bu Atilla Bey de buna değindi. Ben de biraz detaylandıracağım onu. 91-95 yılları arasında bilim tarihi ile ilgili 60'a yakın makale kaleme aldı. 1896 yılında e, rasathane Amire dediğimiz dönemin imparatorluk gözlem evinde e, müdür olarak görev aldı. Yine 95-99 yıllarında e, jeoloji, matematik, meteoroloji, fizik gibi konularda birçok makale yazdı. 1899 yılında e, Atilla Bey'in de bahsettiği e, Kamus-ü Riyaziyat, Matematiksel Bilimler Ansiklopedisi isimli e, eserinin ilk cildini yayımladı. Yine çeşitli okullarda ders vermeye devam etti. Ee, en önemli gene dönemin önemli eğitim kurumlarından Galatasaray Lisesi'nde e, Mektebi Sultanide müdür olarak görev yaptı. 1912 yılında İstanbul Üniversitesi'nde yani da, o zamanki ismiyle Darül Fünun'da e, halk konferansları e, verdiği halk konferanslarını kitap olarak yayınladı. 1912 yılında. 1913'te bugün de içinde bulunmuş olduğumuz İstanbul Üniversitesi'nin o dönemki rektörü oldu. Daha sonra 1917'de Fen Fakültesi'nin kurucuları arasında yer aldı. Ve 1920 yılında aslında erken bir yaşta önce bir psikolojik akli bir rahatsızlık neticesinde 57 yaşında vefat etti ve Fatih Camii Haziresi'ne defnedildi. Şimdi konumuza dönersek Osmanlı e, modern döneminde bilim tarihi yazıcılığı 20. yüzyıl. Klasik olarak aslında Osmanlılar e, İslam klasik geleneğini mir miras aldıkları için 16. yüzyıldan itibaren bu tabakat literatürü dediğimiz alimlerin, şairlerin, edebiyatçıların, e, devlet adamlarının hayat hikayelerini konu alan e, tabakat literatürü geleneğini devam ettirmiştir. Bunun en önemli örneği e, Osmanlı Şakayık-ı Numaniye fi Ulema-i Devleti Osmaniye isimli e, alimler biyografi e, biyografisidir, derlemesidir. E, yine aynı dönemde e, Katip Çek, daha doğrusu 1600'lerde 17. yüzyılda Süllemül Vusul isimli e, yine bir tabakat literatürünün önemli örneklerinden biriyle karşılaşıyoruz. Ama e, genel anlamda burada gelenek Taşköprülü Zade üzerinden yürümekte ve 20. yüzyılın başlarına kadar yazdığı Şakayık isimli eserin eklerini, süplemanlarını ya da eski tabirle zeyllerinin devam ettiğini görüyoruz. Ve böylece bir Şakayık literatürü ortaya çıkıyor.
Finally, the Turkish and Muslim scholars and their contributions in the field of modern sciences. And when you look at the second trend in the Ottoman modern time in uh, writing of history of science, in 1870s, uh, the French scholar Ernest Rena has got a conference about Islam and science, and the Islamic nations and civilizations' reason of staying behind, far behind, is so much related with Islam. So he was having such kind of a claim, and some of the Orientals of his time were having the same claims. For this reason, after 1800s, uh, Ottoman intellectuals and also philosophers have got an opposing idea, opposing claim, and they have developed this approach, and the journals and also newspapers, they have uh, started to write about the contributions of Muslims in science and Arabic and Turkish uh, nations' contributions to science. Actually, Turkish people and Muslim people do have some certain contributions in modernization. So with a political statement, they have claimed those arguments. I am not going to read them one by one, but Are like this mathematics nine algebra one and until 1921 they have continued to publish it. And 
and yeah. My study about deregulation and journalism also published three articles between the years of 1889 and 1921. A majority of them are related with actually the history of science, and the rest of them are general topics, intellectual topics. I won't go into the details of his works. How much time have I left? So you would you frontal axis have been divided chronologically in eighteen eighty nine. He has published his first article about the Indian uh, numbers in eighteen ninety one. Between eighteen ninety one and eighteen ninety five we see a very condensed publication basically focusing on the history of science in 1899 1897 and 19 uh, 1899 he has majorly worked in the field of astronomy physics so more scientific corpus was taken into account and of course uh, Starting from 1908 and 1910, we see more uh, pedagogical type of publications, how to teach uh, some certain actually mathematics for children, for example. You see the names of his works here. I won't go one by one. Between 1891 and 1895, in 26 and 31 columns, you see the publications in school uh, journals and also official gazette. Sonny Ziki has got some focal points in which areas he has written articles. Astronomy in the field of astronomy he has got 10 articles and mathematical sciences and astronomy is his main interest area. 38 in the history of science and 33 in mathematics. 24 of these mathematical articles are uh, based base on uh, algebra and geometry. Of course, some very interesting articles, seven articles about music. Ahmed Mithat Efendi, it was a polemic that he has started to write and um, they were discussing on uh, some certain discussions and also post offices, calendars, and hours, administrative topics have also been written by him. Sani Hsiki, with his encyclopedia about mathematics, which is Kamus Rihansiat, has got another more detailed encyclopedia. We see a uh, the basis of these studies in his articles, Kabizade Rumi Ali Kushchu, Nasretine to see type of people's biographies have firstly been published in his articles and then he's collecting them. And in Asarbaki and Kamus Riyaziat, he is uh, making them in a more detailed version, presenting them with a more detailed version. And among the bi biographies, uh, actually, he's not totally taking himself away from the tradition, somehow enriching it in his content and contributing to literature. There are some, of course, unique features of Sali Seki. He is not dealing with people or the science people, indeed. He is only dealing with the content that those science people are focusing on mathematics, astronomies, main problems and bringing solutions and attempts to bring solutions can be seen. Some examples. The division of angle into three, which is an old problematic coming from Greek and Oakley geometry. And uh, there is a claim which uh, you cannot divide. Uh, actually, it's a shape in three angles. And uh, with his recent studies, an approach to astrology was taking 25 and 30 years 
before him and he was discussing the discoveries and it's a very close um, time discussion about the history of science. Greek and Muslim astronomers studies and the globe shape and the returning of worlds and also the movements of the earth is being discussed in one of his longest article series. Approximately 25 articles have been published on this topic. Riazian, from the eye of the mathematicians, the space was another important conceptual study. It is related with space uh, concept. And he is taking the ancient astronomers point of views and transferring them to our present times approach the roots of mathematical concept the term mathematics this is something very interesting in, in writing of the history of science for the very first time Salisiki is making an etymological study uh, he is looking at the roots of the mathematics and he is also questioning the Riazier the Arabic and the Greek roots with a parallel etymological reading. He is analyzing, comparing these two terms. And in the old and new geometrical fields, Rimogen, Boliers, and modern geometrical approaches are taking place, and the classical geometries topics are being classified, are being com compared and contrasted and classified. Notation algebraic chezle orientoire, which is the algebra, algebra or topic related article. Journal Asiatic has published this article. I'm going to look at this article in more detail manner. In 2021, we have determined two additional manuscripts. One of them is in English. A lecture containing some philosophical and personal considerations on the symbol zero. It's a manuscript, an article as a manuscript form, and in French, Fadun Lasterabade et la religion kabbalistique rufism. So uh, this is a manuscript The study is about these last two articles are very new. I don't know whether the content is an article or not. It can be a symposium note or a conference note. And the second one is a letter which he has written to a professor, to a scholar. In his French uh, writing, he says that Horophysim is something that uh, Fadullah Sarabadi has invented himself. So the further details will be opened with some additional information. As a result, Sali Zeki, for the very first time, has got subject-based problematic approach and openly presenting a new method for the history of science. Kamus Riyaziat, Attila Bey emphasized it in detail. I won't inform you any further. The main objective of writing this, he, will, he has planned it as a four volumes. The first volume was being published in 1899. The rest of the volumes are being kept at Istanbul University's rare books uh, library. And the reason of writing this work was bringing forth uh, the mathematical and astronomical sciences present and old uh, concepts and terminologies and also presenting the people who have works in this field. Kamus Riyaziat has got a new research result. In 1924, after he has passed away, there is a second edition of his book, and uh, the first edition was before his uh, that. In 1895, there is another edition which is being marked as 19,002. In 18,000 edition, it doesn't have any preface, but in the Neve version, in the Neve edition, there is an explanation about uh, the sciences and the techniques and the reason why it was prepared like that. And Kamus Riyaziad was being mentioned as the first volume. 
of these attempts. What Sally Siki would like to do is what Didier and Lambert has uh, written in Paris. He he just wants to make a similar version of their work actually by working on the mathematics and taking the first volume as an example in the field of physics, chemistry, natural sciences, medicine, uh, theology, philosophy, history, geography, politics, and also account financial issues, economics, law, literature, and he has stated that it is possible to write uh, on these disciplines in different fields and actually Kamus Riyazad is mainly focusing on the mathematical sciences and secondly in the preface he is uh, mentioning that all of the Kamus Riyazad contents counting, algebra and trigonometry analysis, mathematics, physics and astronomics can be counted in the content. We understand that Sali Siki's main project was creating an encyclopedia of sciences and techniques and in Kamus Riyaziyat, in the mathematical volume, he wanted to prepare the mathematical content. Actually, Sali Siki's main idea was preparing an encyclopedia of sciences and techniques. I won't focus on Asari Baki a lot. There are main four volumes. And the first two of them ha could be published, could be presented to public. The first one is the spherical trigonometry, and the second one is the accounting and algebra. Astronomy is in the form of manuscript. Geometry, which is the fourth volume, and its manuscripts could not be found. It's all lost. The reason of writing Asarbaki, he just wanted to bring forth what the Eastern scholars have contributed by making use of the Greek mathematics and what they have added and what they have contributed later on to the European mathematical studies. And of course, by having such kind of a presentation, he is also referring the contributions of the political approaches, economical approaches, and he is stating that he's claiming that such kind of judgments may not be aparted from uh, personal understandings and perceptions. So, in order to be objective, he is writing on some mathematical science as a more scientific, uh, with a more scientific and objective approach. He is writing Ernest Brennan. A conference, Islam and uh, Science Conference, uh, he, he was claiming about the missing parts of Islamic civilization, Islamic science, which created a huge, actually, storm in the field of Islamic uh, scholars. Uh, and we see that he's really trying to focus on the Islamic approach uh, within the reading and writing of through science and his relationship with Orientalists is essential to be stated. Bernard Karadevo is a very important, actually, uh, his historian in the field of theology and the field of science, and he has published his works in French. And uh, we have determined the relationship between Salih Zeki and Bernard Karadevo. Uh, one of the main representatives of uh, Alexandria mathematical school and the Byzantium films in the work of pneumatics uh, was being published by Bernard Caridevo in French and in English and also the Istanbul uh, versions was aimed to be compared and contrasted. He has got the Oxford uh, version and uh, Salih Se he is asking from Salih Seki to bring the version from Hagia Sophia library and he is asking him to compare the uh, study which is named as Pneumatic and Salih Seki is stating in a study that those two versions are the same in content and he's sending a copy to Cardevo and in the preface of this of his work Salih Seki is mentioning about the collaboration that he has done with Salih Seki and one of the major orientalists of time, of his time, has got a corresponding relationship with Salih Seki. Secondly, Franz Wopke, 
a very important uh, German Orientalist of his time. He's referring that uh, Salih Siki, one of his writings, states that Wopke is making use of the Muslims, actually. Uh, algebra notation in the 13th century and the algebra was not being used before the 13th century so there are some arguments and polemics among those two actor writers and also in 1889 we do have another article of Salih Seki Memoir sur le chiffre indien and Memoir sur la propagation de chiffre indien article uh, with part Franz Hopke he has got a similarity Must I don't have a clear cut evidence but when Sali Siki was writing his uh, French article Memoir sur le chiffre indien maybe it can be a response to Franz Wopke's Memoir sur la propagation de chiffre indien there can be a such kind of correspondence relationship in conclusion about the scientific approach of Sali Siki I have two slides left I will conclude very soon Sali Siki is has been named as the first author, writer of history of science for the very first time by analyzing the manuscripts and by manuscripts, the original texts of Muslim scholars, he has started his studies. Secondly, the history of science, uh, the contributions and also the solutions and also uh, the contributions have taken into account by him and presented by him. And rather than having the biographical approach and tabakat approach of the scientific people, he is uh, rather focusing on their works and studies and uh, also the methods they present. Sadi uh, Siki relates mathematics and astronomy with uh, the contributions of Greek and Indian cultures in the Mesopotamian studies. He is uh, referring to Islamic civilizations' contributions and all of the transformed and transpassed information to the Western world. And Sadi uh, Siki states the issue of problematic contributions and uh, he's starting science and also scientific approaches from Greek and Indian cultures Mesopotamia was not in uh, was not known in depth and what is the civilization description of Sanisiki of course uh, he's uh, knowingly not taking the impact of political, social and economical uh, issues the in, uh, in the field of science and he is not making any Western and Eastern comparison and contrast. So for uh, last but not least, I would like to say that there was no such tradition continued after Sali Siki. So after his death in 1921, even the publication of his works uh, were in So we need to, to uh, be Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for their contributions in the organization of this conference. And I have uh, listened to both my colleagues, Attila and Alpaj, who have uh, made comprehensive presentations on Salih Zeki. And there are topics uh, that are um, actually intersecting uh, but I will focus mostly on uh, the uh, historiography of uh, science, uh, history of science, in that uh, sense, uh, 
and and I will focus then on of uh, Siskin's contributions and conclude about the historiography uh, of science in Turkey. So, um, uh, which science do we focusing are, are we talking about? Of course, there is an overall uh, concept, but in a more uh, specific uh, terms, we can say historiography of mathematics is uh, is going to be the um, topic of my uh, speech. So to say, as you know, science is an objective uh, work and. Uh, and, and such an authority and uh, in the sense we're In that sense, when we are uh, making or, or uh, writing the history of such an objective uh, topic, uh, we uh, sometimes uh, have the error of becoming subjective and uh, private. We know that all the authors of the, of the histories of uh, science are uh, uh, proficient in their areas. However, we see that some of these can be a subjective focusing on geography, on culture, and uh, this can be avoided or not. That's another topic of debate, a philosophical debate. But it is possible any minute for each and every one of us to uh, falter in this, uh, in this sense. Uh, Tamasco uh, says that as the history of uh, science is is not only a chronological um, a linear uh, depiction and discourse. So what he means there is what Thomas Kuhn means there is that you know we need to talk about the outer paradigms, the internal dynamics should be included in the reciting of the history of science. So we need to be aware of uh, how and under which conditions that science emerges and develops. So in that sense, the history of science is also um, here before us as the history of uh, scientific theories. And of course, at this point, uh, the, uh, the topics on, on what, under which conditions science emerges and develops and uh, which factors contribute to it are also important. So in terms, um, Kit Jenkins also has a few t questions and uh, in order to uh, question uh, the, um, the, the possibility of uh, um, relaying or practicing history in an objective way is uh, in that sense history um, always objective or uh, it's practical is it um, independent or ideological or unbiased or subjective so we need to of course, uh, we in our work try to uh, focus on objectivity, but these are very good questions, uh, philosophical questions. And actually, Jenkins. Uh, it is uh, predominant of its own time. So, in a sense, it takes history out of the school of what we call science, and uh, history is uh, in this way no different than uh, literature or any interpretive art in that sense. But this is, I think, a good topic of debate for the um, history of science in itself as well. So, um, 
Of course, in the history of science, uh, when we do research of, on the past, we ask a few questions also for our own research. You know, these are classical questions, you know, uh, why did uh, the Renaissance emerge in Europe in a certain period and nowhere else in no other period? So although these seem to be philosophical questions, these are topics that the um, uh, the historians of science are working upon and, uh, you know, why have uh, the internal and external factors uh, caused the emergence of modern science and why has the uh, scientific center in Baghdad uh, lost its efficiency and productivity after the 13th century and why did the Ottomans um, abandon the uh, oriental uh, school of thought in the 18th century and look towards the West. Um, so these are the questions that are actually paving the way towards the um, towards the establishment of a history of science. And these are the topics of the debates as uh, from the point of view of Jenkins. When you want to answer these questions, you have to uh, work with the philosophy of science and uh, with the, uh, the history of science and the uh, literature of science as well. We have to touch upon these as well. Yes. Um, each and every answer uh, to uh, these uh, questions uh, also lead to um, other questions, which will lead us to the or, or to the question. sağduyunun ortak olarak yazıcılığının da nesnel olması gerektiğidir. Evet, yani aslında matematik tarihçiler olarak biz biraz daha nispeten sızız e, ki e, matematik tarihinde yine de e, görelikçi, yorumsalcı boşluklara disiplin kendi konusu gereği fazla yer bulunmuyor. Ancak bütün bu e, tutarlılığına rağmen matematikte, matematik tarihi de çeşitli postmodern eleştirilerden e, nasibini almaktan e, kaçınamıyor. Örneğin etnomatematik diye bir kavram çıktı son zamanlarda. Diyor ki bu etnomatematik yerel ve göreceli bir e, matematiğin mümkünlüğü vardır diyor. Ama buradaki yerellikten kasıt coğrafi konum değil. Yani coğrafi konum merkezli bir yerellikten bahsetmiyor. E, asıl kastettiği şey alternatif bir matematik. Yani e, belli bir alternatif matematiğin oluşması meselesi. Ama tabii yani herhangi bir matematiksel söylemde e, kendini kanıtladığı zaman evre, evrensel söylem içinde e, yerini alabildiğine göre yani böyle bir şeyden e, bahsetmek ya matematikten anlayanlar için pek mümkün değildir. E, olduğunu düşünmüyorum en azından. Çünkü farklı ifadeler aynı şeyleri temsil edebilir. E, yine ortak duyu mecburen bir yerde buluşuyor. Yes, uh... Evet. O zaman e, ne yapmamız lazım ki bu e, yani tehlikeli düzlemde aslında işimizi e, doğru yapalım. Nesna bir şekilde e, bir e, teknik e, oluşturarak bu işleri e, kotarabilelim. E, dolayısıyla öncelikle matematik tarihi özelinde e, yapılması gereken şey. Yani tabii bu konferansın konusu biraz da tarih yazıcılığı olduğu için buraya e, biraz fazla yer vermek istedim ben konuşmamda. E, yani ne yapılacak o zaman? Biz nasıl yaz, yazacağız? Yani ya da nasıl çalışacağız? Yani sonuçta e, birey olarak e, öznellik tehlikesine düşmemek için neler yapmamız lazım? Evet ki öncelikle e, çalışılan alan e, çok iyi bilinmeli. E, ve dolayısıyla bunun... E, Disiplinler arası ayrımın da e, aslında göreceli olarak daha yeni bir kavram olduğunu e, düşünürsek, yani matematik çalışırken mesela işte astronomi, optik, fizik, müzik vesaire gibi diğer matematiksel alanların da e, birazcık birazcık anlaşılması gerekiyor ki e, yorumlana, yorum, yorumlanırken e, olabildiğince nesnel e, düzlemde kalınabilsin. Elbette ki dil e, yine çok iyi bir şekilde. E, bilinmeli ve e, kullanılmalı. Esas tabii ki tehlike demin de dediğimiz gibi bu değerlendirme ve yorumlama kısmında ortaya çıkıyor. Yani geçmişe yönelik e, değerlendirmeler yaparken e, 
burada öznel yorumlama tehlikelerine düşülebiliyor. Bana kalırsa çalışmanın en zor aşaması bu. Yani kişilerin mensubu oldukları ondan sonra fikirlerin veya ekollerin de denebilir. Ne derece, tabii az önce de bahsettiğim gibi yani ne derece dışına çıkarak bir insan olarak belli yorumları yapabilirsiniz. Bu yani felsefi olarak bir tartışma konusu. Buna burada yani ayrıca bir vakit ayırmak gerekir başka bir konferansın konusunda. Şimdi Alper hocamın da az önce anlattığı gibi Salih'teki de örneğin yani o anlatırken ben onu düşündüm. Tamamıyla nesnel bir matematik tarihi yazıcılığı düzleminde kalmaya çalıştığını örneğin görüyorum. Şimdi Türkiye'de bu işler nasıl yapılıyor veya işte 20. yüzyıla kadar olan yeri çok güzel özetledi Alper Hocam. Daha sonra veya işte günümüzden baktığımızda bunu genellemek mümkün mü? Şimdi Türkiye'de bilim tarihi araştırmalarının geçmişi 19. yüzyıl sonu 20. yüzyılın başı diye kabul edildiği zaman işte Salih Zeki Bey'i ilk bilim tarihçimiz olarak kabul ettiğimiz zaman yavaş yavaş bilim tarihi çalışmaları Adnan Adıvar gibi <gülüyor> bilginlerin yapmış oldukları çalışmalar sonucunda da yavaş yavaş tanınmaya ve sevilmeye başlanıyor ve üniversite içine girerek öğretimin bir parçası olması da aydın sayılıyla mümkün oluyor. Bu Remzi de alıntı burada ekranda gördüğünüz. Şimdi tarih boyunca e, Remzi Demir diyor ki yani e, bilim, genel bir e, özet e, yapmış kendisi burada onu paylaşmak istiyorum. Diyor ki e, bilim tarihi araştırmalarının iki temel işlevi bulunmaktadır. Birincisi tarih boyunca gerçekleştirilen ulusal bilim etkinliklerinin nitelik ve niceliğini belirlemek ve bunların evrensel bilim etkinliği da yine And, and these um, determinations are, are quite important and significant uh, in the evaluation of history of science in Turkey as a, a national uh, in a national uh, context. You can the works of Sadi Ki. As I said, I'm not going to go in into his works bizim e, tarihimizde özel bir yeri var. E, bir başka bilim tarihçisi aslında matematik tarihçisi değil ama e, not a, a mathematics per se but, uh, a very important Halide Edip Adıvar'ın ilk eşi de Salih Zeki. Burada da böyle bir <gülüyor> ortaklık söz konusu. Osmanlı ilim ve tarih boyunca ilim ve din bu eserler gerçekten dönemi. Uh, during his uh, residence in France, uh, he um, brought together the content of these books, of these works. Aydın Sayılı is another historian of science. He is the first one who established uh, the, the chair of history of science in the university. 
lived between 1913 and 1993, and uh, the father of Aydin Sayula uh, was stationed in, in Persia. So some of his childhood was spent in Persia, and then he moved to Istanbul uh, for his primary school and then to Ankara for his secondary school education. And he uh, graduated from the uh, Istanbul Archaic High School. And uh, the president of the time, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, was present in his um, um, maturity exam and uh, graduating from high school and he was impressed by his ingenuity and he was chosen to be among the students sent abroad for higher education and together with the uh, uh, together with another student they, he sent to Harvard to study history of science after high school and he works with famous historian of science George Sarton and uh, he has the first PhD, uh, he, one of the first PhDs in the history of science in the world. And uh, so he is a very significant man for, in his own terms and also for the country as well. He returns to Turkey in 1943 and in, uh, starts to lecture in the philosophy department of Ankara University and establishes the chair of history of uh, science as well in 1952. And uh, throughout his term here in the university, he trains many PhD students and 53 of them, Sevim Tekeli, Esin Kahya, and Melih Dosai are among these students. And, and also, I would like to point out that he uh, has a broad scope, uh, history of mathematics, history of astronomy, and, uh, and other uh, disciplines as well, in which he trains the PhD students, so that they can train students of themselves uh, in, their in their respective disciplines and areas as well. He is not uh, a historian of mathematics uh, per se, because uh, he's trained in Harvard, not on a specific level, but on a broader terms to be able to establish the chair of history of uh, science in Ankara when he returns. So he has works on various uh, disciplines and uh, fields. So you can see here, of course, uh, he has works on observatories uh, in Ottoman and Egypt, uh, mathematical astronomy, medicine, and uh, the works of uh, Abdulhamid ibn Turk uh, on solid uh, equations. and. Uh, he has works on uh, various re uh, fields as well, and uh, you can see here uh, the uh, on the paper of the uh, banknote of five lira. You can see his picture uh, depicted. Uh, so, of course, in, in the uh, historiography of science in Turkey, uh, we have to mention uh, Prof. Dr. Uh, Fuat Sezgin. Uh, he's one of the prominent figures in Turkey in terms of history of science. Um, I would like to conclude with him. He was born in 1924 in, in Bitlis, and especially he has worked on the literature and has uh, made great contributions uh, to the literature. And in, uh, as we know, in June 2018, he passed away. And in 1954, uh, he uh, establishes his thesis on the resources of uh, Buhari as a student of uh, Salmut Ritter. And uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Hogentag mentioned in his speech about uh, the fact that he has also a year of mathematics education as well in his background. So during his later works, he made use of this background uh, quite a lot. And I would like to uh, add that as well to, to his uh, background. So when he made his mathematical choices and preferences, he made use of that background, uh, which is something that I've learned myself yesterday from the professor. So later on, he travels to Germany in 61 and uh, works uh, as the um, um, visiting lecturer of uh, Frankfurt University and uh, then continues his work there. 
and uh, establishes a museum there, and uh, and then uh, establishes a similar one in Istanbul Gürhane Park as well. I would like to focus on uh, his work on um, uh, mathematics history, especially on the Geschichte des Arabischen Schrifttums. Uh, fifth and sixth volumes are focusing on mathematics and astronomy, and uh, also uh, there are some facsimile publications about uh, 1300 volumes. Um, and, uh, and when I was uh, in Germany, I got to meet him as well, and uh, I was his guest in, the, in his institute. And he had told me when we met that, uh, you know, I was focusing on history of geography, but to work with uh, history of geography, uh, I have to work with the history of mathematics as well, as I said to him. And he said that, and so uh, maybe in the, and, and he said to me whether I would uh, also f continue to focus on uh, history of geography in my later work as well. And he focused the importance of mathematics to be able to work with geography as well to me at that time. And you see here science and uh, technology or, or technique in, um, in Islam. Uh, you can see here uh, the third, uh, the first volume is introduction, second volume astronomy, third volume geography, and fourth volume medicine, chemistry, and fifth volume physics and uh, techniques and architecture as well. So you can see here, you know that he has um, other prominent works as well, but later after that, of course, I'm going to end my speech here because after that we go to contemporary uh, works and uh, Mujela talked about uh, the recent past and the contemporary period as well yesterday. So I think our speeches have been complimentary. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. The speaker needs to use microphone. The speaker needs to use microphone.
of second international professor Dr. Fuad Sesgin symposium on the history of science in Islam. We do have three distinguished speakers. Our first speaker will be delivered by Nazan Karakash. Our second speaker will be Mustafa Demirji. I cannot see him. He was here as I have seen. Most probably he will come. Our third speaker will be Ravda El Hadji. And she's going to attend our session from an online platform. Without going further, I would like to leave the floor to Nazan Hanum. As you like, you can speak from here or there, from the computer side. Please limit yourself within 20 minutes. Let's use the last five minutes as a Q&A and a commentary time. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who have contributed in organization of this symposium. I'm grateful to them. And also, I would like to commemorate Fad Sezgin with his contributions in our history of science, we do have the privilege of this gathering. The topic which I'm going to present today is a small piece of a big study. I will try to wrap up as much as I can. The history of geography has been my field of expertise for a while and the method issue, which is the main topic of this symposium throughout my works, throughout my studies, have stayed back of my head and what type of a methodology we need to establish so that we can extract the data as geography expert uh, from history and transform them into a useful uh, knowledge. There are three main uh, steps which I will go through. The first one is related with the theoretical side of the issue. I have figured out some certain methodological outcomes. And then I'm going to share the methodology uh, from an empirical perspective. And lastly, I will have a general evaluation of the process and how we can examine the old maps will be the uh, limited scope of this presentation does these old uh, maps do have any value for us and if they have any value how we can examine them and of course if we are in need of uh, making a huge uh, literature review i'm going to share the reference in the beginning of my presentation and i will say a few words after having the modern approach in uh, cartography in the field of maps actually is actually it's starting after 1950s the institutionalization is starting after 1950s and first of all they have started to examine the history of maps before establishing a theory before doing something futuristic they have looked at the past and past experiences and starting from the first map they have started to work by establishing a commission and for this reason, I'm sharing this literature with you. When we look diachronic, we are going back to Asian Sankonus. And of course, when we look at the content uh, of the literature, actually, there are huge contents of Azak Levere and many other names can be pronounced. They are the major uh, contributors of their time. And also beyond that, they are the uh, histographers of map history, cartographic history, and what they have done what they have carried out in their studies and how did they examine the maps and within the framework of the actually these questions I have had an examination how we need to study what type of a methodology we can propose to examine the old maps whether they are useful or not when we look within historian approach everything old everything coming from history do have a certain value but when you pass to the field of geography the value of that knowledge is becoming something to be discussed maybe we will get into this discussion why it is essential to discuss why because when you shift the area the dynamics and the quality and the modern structure is looking for some other features and for this reason we are speaking about different methodologies different approaches 
uh, is it going to be possible to extract the old maps and uh, rather than being the subject of history, can we transform them into something contributing to our present time, our present sciences? Can we transform them into something beneficial? We know that since the early times of humanity, maps are present, it's an instrument and it's a way of communicating. Just like a manuscript of all times, it's very valuable and that map, that drawing, whatever is being drawn, whatever has been mapped actually has got a value because it contains a certain amount of knowledge and information and year by year it gains importance and the cartographic Histography, of course, gained a great importance, and uh, with the institutionalization and with some certain practices and approaches, they have created some main access to create the uh, mindset of maps. Why maps have gained importance? Actually, we need to speak about uh, the concept of reality, and also we need to speak about, of course, appropriateness it is directly related with uh, the truthness rightness accuracy and what is the map of what does the meaning of chatalouik or from maro's maps do mean for us these questions have been in my mind to take my further steps and the establishment of cartography commission and uh, also establishing the cartographic approaches and also when I go through this progress I have seen that in mass the modern sciences are developing and when we look at their progress cartography gained a great importance when we look at the middle age Islamic world maps are very important when we look synchronically and diachronically at every stance maps are very important instruments we see that I have shared a literature with you and uh, it is possible to make a classification. What do the cartographers worked on? work on? Some of them work on some theories, some of them work on history, the history of map, what happened, which map is being created, when type of uh, questions are being responded and some of them have worked on the roots and the history and also social meanings and some of them have made some analysis about accuracy and also the geographical features of these maps. The basis of my study is presenting two important sources. One of them is Irvin Rice's so it's a general cartography book. It is the first dynamics of cartographic methodology. And the second one is Arthur Robinson's two books, The Look of Maps, and the second one is The Elements of Cartography. They are the basic conceptual frameworks. And after this preparation process, I have figured out a methodological approach. As far as I could see, what is being named as map has got a dual structure. In the first stage uh, it is uh, in accordance with the positivist approaches and it is very suitable for empirical totes and some methodologies can be figured out from maps so a map is an evidence for a certain time and space so there is the accuracy and in, you cannot speculate on that it is not allowing you to do that there is a scale and about that space about that time and there is a precise actually uh, information and in Google, by making use of these maps, we are going to a certain time and we are moving towards a certain space. And, and there are some certain stabilized uh, concrete symbols. And there is the accuracy, there is the precise person. And there is a critical side in the second step that we can approach the maps. Because of uh, its contemporary standing point, there is a continuous transformation of map. And really, it is changing, it is evolving, so there is an evolution in cartography to figure out some certain meanings in order to discuss the content, in order to actually stabilize the context of its time, it is possible to discuss on some certain issues. We can discuss it. Neither the first structure nor the second structure may fully give us the meaning of map. 
we can combine these dual senses of mapping, the cartographical approach, and we can speak about a, a historical and cartographical research. And this is the actually scheme we have created. This is the eclectic structure, but they are very imp uh, open to discussion. I'm sharing it with you right now. Maybe that it is going to transform into a publication. It is not something uh, present because I say it. It is essential to discuss on these features. This is what I see. There is an eclectic structure on one and there are more empirical studies. On the other side, there is a structure which is suitable for critical. Dissertation, you uh, take into account the methodology. When we use the traditional methodologies, when I use the historian's methodology, the outcome of that data is not being meaningful. When some other people are making use of geography's data from the field of history, the outcome data is not being meaningful. So the methodology should, sh should serve our needs, our field, our area. And uh, of course, we need to make uh, reach to a consensus by evaluating these two sides, dualistic side of this approach. Up until now, is of course directly related with the structure, with the organizational structure of my approach. And of course, it was a, a speculative approach. I did not leave it here. I have selected the map as an empirical study, and I'm going to share you. The examples. It is Orange Fine's map, which was produced in 15,034. It is a 16th century map, and it has got features for today's discussion. This the creator of this map is a astronomer and also a mathematician, and also. He has prepared Francois I, the French king, Francois I in 1534 by Orange Fine. Um, it has got two versions. On one side, there is the concrete, actually, uh, information inside the content, but on the other side, many social, political, religious transformations can be figured out. I mean, the Renaissance and the 16th centuries features are also embedded in the content so it has got a very rich content when you take this map and when you work on this map it is possible to create a thesis for this reason i have selected this map and inside this map uh, there by making use of the positive approaches i have analyzed the documents and the, i have analyzed the content in turkey there are 52 geographic departments i have sent them a survey and I figured out some certain uh, concepts and I have asked them to approve it or to discuss it. And from 12 departments, I have received responses and among the responses, we have discuss discussed it uh, with a few colleagues of mine and we have prepared a list. When we look at the map from a positive side, how we are going to analyze the content with its accuracy, with its reality, the map do have some certain features. And they respond to this question, the question how we can analyze it. There are some certain scanning terms. And we have analyzed it. And all of the analyzed results will not be shared in detail. I have very limited time. I do not want to go beyond that. I will only share a few of them. I'm going to share you the feed some certain actually mapping features, some demonstrative features. I have downloaded the map from Gallica library and uh, above the digital copy, we have made use of our software and I have made some amendments. This is the original version of the map. When we transfer it to Actus uh, program, this is the digitalized version. On the right side, you see our present times uh, world map and on our map we have placed the same version the same projection it's a heart shaped quadriform type of uh, actually form you can see it on the left side it's more clear and then we look at the accuracy of two sides it is possible to com compare and contrast them 
with their precision and accuracy on the upper side you see the actual world map down below that almost finds a map can be seen it's very interesting and the findings are very interesting when you look at first dance actually you can figure out some commands and on the upper side you see a half closed table in this table you see the positions and if also you see the longitude and also latitude values you can compare uh, and contrast the spa spaces that it uh, positions itself it is possible to compare and contrast the length and when we go into the details you see the Anatolian region and the surrounded area surrounding area this is the digitalized version in the middle and on the very left side you see the original version of the Anatolian map it is possible to figure out a lot of results if you don't have Marmara Sea Istanbul is not also Present. We will not say it's not present. Of course, that's not enough. Why it's not pre is why isn't it present? There is a critical approach that we are going to look at this map. We need to look at this map. And the first step, we are looking what we are observing, what we are seeing. That's why I have said something is missing. We can say that this map was drawn very bad. But is it really drawn very bad? Is it something actually? lacking some certain information then the second one we are going to criticize that we are going to discuss that and there are some methodologies of critical approach as meanings and concepts as much as we can we would like to have synchronic uh, comparisons and there is history there is economy sociology psychology and many things are involved inside this to respond to this question why is this like that and there are some certain items which I have determined. If when we are going to approach a map with a critical point of view, nature, the philosophy of nature and the existence, cosmology, and world perception, and also we can look at it from the perspective of knowledge, from the perspective of uh, symbol, symbolization, and what type of images have been used, and we can look at it from the actually plain, plain and spheric approaches economical political and social topics can be also another perspective to look at it now only we are going to share with you the ecumenic spheric actually approach there is a there is a transformation from uh, ecumen to sphere. Why is this important? In uh, this is Erotesen's uh, actually Erotesen's map. There is an area, an habitus, a residential area where people are majorly living or uh, having maps. This is the perception. We cannot uh, dis discuss it on means of accuracy. We need to look at it with a critical point of view and with the perception of that time. On this side. On the right side, according to you, is Batalusus. I'm sorry, on the left side, you see the Batalusus Plotemi map. In 14006, this is the oldest version of uh, Batalusus map. You see the Eretasian wheel, and it is turning into curves arc-like structures. The parallel lines are transformed into arc-like structures. So there is a perceptual change. Well, how you perceive uh, the world, the plane, there are some shifts in perception. On the right side, you see the Fromaros map. In Eratasian, you have seen there was a rectangular frame which they were placing the world. Now they are placing the world in a spheric structure. And Framara is a very important turning point in Korar Museum with the date 14,059 this was drawn and we see the fingerprints of a transformation. A small note for the map. Uh, north side is North Pole is on the South Pole, South Pole is in no on the North Pole. So this is what I would like to mention in parentheses. And there is Silvanus's map in 15,011. 
to see the change in perception, all of the plane structure is transforming into a spheric structure. There is a transformation we accurately see here. In 15,030, there was the map of fine, Orne's fine. So, the spheric structure is being placed on a plane and there are some certain projections from different sides. So this is a movement, this is a transformative way of approach. The critical point of view states us that we need to compare. This is Valsi Müller's map. Why is this map important? For the very first time, the name America was being uh, placed here. Vespucci's, America Vespucci's name is being placed on this. And 16th century, the world is starting to appear and human beings, ge geographers and cartographers have started to think world as a whole, not as a space uh, where people are only living now. So that spheric thought is appearing by 15,000s. When we look at the transformative knowledge theory, the maps are actually carrying a certain amount of knowledge with their drawings, but we see some notes on the maps. And in the knowledge theory, you see the that transformative force. Uh, they are adding as much knowledge notes as they can in order to understand, in order to interpret. This is Marcator's world map uh, from 15,069. And you see some notes. In the same period, you see 15,013 uh, map, Wadzi Müller's map. This is the Indian, uh, actually, side of India is being shown here. So there are some visuals. Not only the nodes they're adding, they're also adding some visuals. And if, do these visuals do have any meaning? Of course, they do have some certain meanings. When we are transforming the map, uh, should we, of course, make any pictures? What should be the quality of these pictures? Are they related with our perception? In Piri Reis's map, we see the similar drawings. It is not realistic, but it is re uh, reflecting the reality of that time. And what is evolving around as an information, as a knowledge, is being reflected in the Middle Age in Christian world's understandings are being reflected. And Wok and Mokok's world are being somehow described. So there are descriptive type of uh, drawings and the king is sitting with his actually a baton in his hand. And another important issue is the pattern uh, ownership. And 15,002 Cantino map has got an ownership issue because the Portuguese people have colored the areas which was belonging to them and they have uh, also marked their symbol. It's just like a registration document. And the, you see the south coast of United States, Portuguese region, Tortoisillas lines, eastern sites uh, have been left to Portuguese, and the rest of them have been taken by Spain, and the uh, western coast of Africa can be seen. When we look into the details, and you see the Portuguese regions and the people living there, and also the figures related with people living there. Another Mercator's projection. Mercator really wins in this combat. He was preferred. His projection style in the 16th century, we see a lot of trials and there are a lot of forms which we see, but we are coming across with a similar actually style which we see today, which are present time. And in Turkey, we prefer the same projection in our country. We prefer it because it's showing Anatolia and also the Thracian region in the middle. We prefer this version. So there is a coloring effect also. By the end of the century, it was revised in 1825, but it was prepared before that time. Uh, the very well-known places are not very, sh uh, very shown. And there is the actually worry of making something symbolic in the transformation of knowledge, actually, that symbolizing issue is really finding a space to be implemented. 
And also transformative knowledge theory is having some changes, uh, some internal factors, external factors. We can discuss them. On the, when we are criticizing a map, these are the points to be discussed. So let me conclude my speech by sharing you the evaluations of my study. Actually, the maps are following a certain level of experience. Of course, uh, it's, there is an accumulation of information and old maps actually do have a great space and uh, whether they contain the scientific knowledge or not, are they valuable for us or not. There are some scientific researches that we carry on among them and we are sharing this information with us. About Tunisian uh, Haj Ahmed, I made a study with the same projection. He has drawn some certain maps. If you're interested on that, you can look at my study. It's a very important map to be shared. Maybe it has not been brought for, not for the, but for the very first time with the, by the Ottoman Empire, they have published it. Is it important for the uh, Ottoman history, for, for the Ottoman researchers? In order to discuss this, we need to uh, accept this uh, actually accumulated, this accredited uh, source, this build up source as as a source of knowledge. We need to have a diachronic and synchronic approach. We need to have a positivist approach and then there is a dual structure of maps and when we are figuring out a methodology to examine it, that dual factor should be taken into account and this eclectic methodology to gain the information that I would like to draw out is very beneficial, was very much contributing. This is all I would like to say. Thank you for your patience for listening to me. They are not using the microphone. So for translation, they need to use the microphone. Um, so uh, maybe we can continue the time uh, she has left with this uh, comment. Uh, so she uh, looked into the methodology of examining uh, the maps uh, without scale and did series. As a historian myself, I have also been very interested in this. And before my comments, I would like to get any questions from your side, from the side of the audience, if there are any, please. We would like to thank Nazan for this wonderful uh, and informatory speech. However, uh, I would like to ask about the uh, Haj Ahmed of Tunisia and Orose Fine. Yes, I, I call it Fine, but I don't know how it's pronounced in French. Uh, uh, so uh, this this similarity uh, of their maps in the almost the same years and in the same period, I am wondering whether it, this is it's these two people are the same person. Is it possible? Uh, of course, one is uh, 1534 for Orese Finn, and uh, 1560 is the uh, map of Haj Ahmed of Tunisia. So uh, I uh, have uh, compared and contrasted these two with the methodology that I just mentioned. And what came up is that it cannot be the same person who drew both these maps uh, because the projection of Orens Fan uh, settles into the projection of uh, Haj Ahmed of Tunisia, but the content doesn't fit. So I, I don't know Latin, but uh, you know the fact that you know uh, some of the, uh, uh, the place names and some of the content are familiar. But uh, the Haj Ahmed of Tunisia is much more advanced in his content of the map. I had it in my presentation, but then I took it out because I thought there would not be enough time. Uh, you know, in that sense, uh, it was. It, it was sort of oh, it's always thought that uh, this is a, a text that will go from the west to the the Ottoman until the Ottoman. But uh, I see that uh, there is a lot more content in the map of Hajamet. Fasizgin also talks about this of the Kimat Turks, and uh, in their map, uh, there which includes a lot of content and information. Maybe Zekeria has more knowledge on this. So they, we have had a map of Asia uh, coming from them and can come. Combined uh, with this, but uh, 
um, the the placements and accuracy of the placements, the accuracy of the depiction of Anatolia, of the coasts, uh, is uh, much more accurate and precise in the um, in the map of Haj Ahmed as compared to that of uh, Finn. So uh, the projection gives you the framework to be able to uh, to bring the uh, the main skeleton onto the plane of the map. But when then you're going to the uh, through the d details, drawing the uh, the coasts and other details, I believe you need to have more detail than just the projection, the canvas. So I believe the uh, Haj Ahmed of Tunisia has had very good education in this and has also transferred the oriental resources, um, including these maps by the Kinoturks into this because there are um, uh, text talking about uh, or, or mentioning uh, the details. There are, of course, studies on this. So uh, let me just briefly say it cannot be the same map because uh, the uh, map of Ajamit uh, Tunisia cannot be a Western-based uh, map as well. Uh, actually, um, some of the Western scholars that do not uh, consider this as a uh, do, do consider this as a Western resource. It is not, and even if it's not an Ottoman resource, it can at most be a combination of Ottoman plus Western resources. So, uh, so this because this map includes the content that's uh, coming from Ottoman sources as well, resources as well. These three maps that I showed you, remember the world map uh, section of that. If you will uh, notice, it sees that the, the map of to the, the Hajar Mit is almost exactly accurate as the uh, ones we have today. Um, maybe Piriri's map is also um, very accurate, 1513 to 1560. It's also on here. Maybe he has made use of that map as well because that map was drawn in Venice. And you know, you have that uh, area in it as well. And uh, uh, the, there is significant know how in Venice, and though uh, in, in map making and cartography, and it's that know how that also initiates the, uh, the expeditions as well. So. Another question. Yes, hello. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, I am a PhD student in Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakuf University, and uh, medieval uh, cartography and mythological factors in that is my topic. Uh, so it was very important for me that you brought these two different approaches and methodologies because in order to be able to convey those old maps to the current uh, science and, and um, literature, I mean, it's very important for us able to combine the past with the present, the old with the new, because sometimes we have even difficulty in presenting the contemporary, the new, um, let alone uh, including the symbols and discourses uh, of the past com um, combining it. So therefore, I would like to work uh, extensively on this eclectic structure that you have proposed. Is there any a specific map that you are focusing on uh, on uh, medieval? We took, we started with the Memul map and we took it to uh, Piri Reis and, and continued with the Kazwani and Ibn Hakal maps as well and especially in Astahri's map on 14th century miniature uh, uh, version for the for the palace for the royal house uh, depicting the uh, prophets and then uh, symbols of mountains and um, similar natural phenomena. So we made uh, a survey of resources and uh, we looked into how the development went from antiquity to uh, say, have you come into this issue of the, uh, the bizarre and the fantastical? Yes, we went into that as well. So we, we, we focused it as, named it as mythological factors in the medieval cartography. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, of course, a discussion that we can carry much further, and uh, Nazan has actually paved the way for even broader horizons for us. So maybe the uh, issue of um, uh, mythological resources being included in cartography could be an, an important topic for us. We see that uh, an important part of maps uh, 
include uh, factors of history uh, and, and, and as well besides observation because observation was not possible in the sense that we have it today. Uh, so uh, we need to make a correlation with the uh, text of history so that uh, especially the, the specific uh, periods, uh, for example, the 1560s, that's a time when we, in, in the Ottoman Empire, we have started to uh, focus on uh, various uh, texts and uh, in that sense essays and compositions so um, in that sense uh, we have started to keep uh, new uh, uh, records in that sense and after the 1860s we have the uh, registries uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, uh, cadastral land surveys as well in the terms of um, deed and ownership of land. So I believe all these records and registries need to be taken into account when uh, evaluating maps. And this is, of course, this is not an expert view. This is just uh, coming from someone who has listened to your speech and trying to make sense of it. Of course, uh, we had, uh, of course, in our agenda, an, an atlas evaluation there, uh, whether an atlas is something which is fully imported or um, is it uh, really, um, it, it does it also include some historical data? And uh, we, we cannot make do without the methodologies of uh, historical research uh, on evaluating these maps. So I see that uh, history and geography should work hand in hand, especially in terms of cartography. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. And we move on to our second. Uh, we will have Mustafa Demirji who will be talking about the map of the Abbasid Talif El Memun. Please, sir. Uh, you will have 20 minutes for your speech and followed by Q&A session as well. Same Bashkan. Esteemed chairs, esteemed guests, I would like to greet you all. Uh, no, I had my fair share of rain in Istanbul while coming here, uh, so I was a little late to the session. Uh, but um, I'm here now. So what I would like to share with you is the map of Memun and uh, and I'm sure that uh, we, it has been mentioned in other lectures as well. I just noticed that we have PhD students working on it as well. I would like to see uh, their work as well. So on my speech, I would like to first focus that the uh, issues of uh, cartography and um, geography has a, a lexicon of its own and terminology of its own. So therefore, the uh, rather than the technical details of the, um, the astronomical tables, the cartography uh, tables, the JITS, I would like to talk a little bit about the story of the preparation of this map and what kind of a technique was used. Uh, I would like to focus on these topics as they are reflected in the historical sources. And uh, of course, um, the uh, reconstructions that have reached the current days through the efforts of uh, scholars like uh, Fad Sezgin. I would like to uh, mention Islam from the 8th century until the 16th century. a significant and and uh, the worldview 
universe of the Islamic world was very uh, efficient or very important in this sense. And you can see here a large scale society of Islam um, uh, and, and it, its, it's uh, efforts to solve the issues that this uh, large scale world uh, were brought in terms of uh, cartography and sciences. And then the know how and the heritage that have come to this uh, society, to this uh, community has uh, allowed them to make all these developments and advancements and of course the uh, that topped with the support and patronage of the uh, rulers of Islam to these such efforts including the uh, Abbasid Khalif al Memun as I mentioned so not just al Memun we know that all of the uh, Islamic leaders so to say other caliphs were quite uh, uh, influential in uh, all these works, developments of the sciences in that sense. So uh, the process that ba forms the basis of the uh, um, cartography uh, are actually translations from Greek and uh, but before that Indian astronomy so we see that the data uh, gives us that these translations have taken place uh, or around uh, 730 to 734 uh, Siddhanta Konda Kadokya um, of uh, our Utya Kadya Kadokya and uh, Kanda Karakdokia have been tra translated by Jakub Intarik and Bishrel Fezari in these uh, times. So this is actually a first initiation period of these translations so before the uh, overall uh, developments in this area. And uh, there are delegations uh, to the Abbasid Caliphate uh, uh, first uh, time for the first delegation, the, the Khalif is on his deathbed, and uh, these are there are astronomers in this delegation, and they have books uh, which mention the numeric cipher zero in there. And uh, with the uh, order of Mansur, uh, the uh, Sintind has been uh, translated under the name Sintind Kebir, and after that, in Harun Rashid period, uh, there have been significant developments with Indian um, uh, with scholars of Indian background who have formed uh, a tradition of um, Indian uh, tradition of uh, science and uh, astronomy uh, we have not focused on this we are normally nowadays focused on the Hellenic uh, background uh, as a source however uh, the Indian uh, source and origins have been very very um, influential in these first uh, periods around the palace and uh, Kufti says that um uh, first of all, uh, the Indian scholars were active in this field, followed by the Persian scholars as well. And the uh, Persian-Indian tradition uh, was actually uh, mentioned in literature. However, the Persian Hellenic uh, literature is quite different. The, the Persian literature was actually, uh, actually representing a more Hellenic tradition. And uh, the Persian Hellenic uh, tradition and the Indian tradition were actually the antithesis and they uh, met and combined uh, to bring together their know-how uh, which uh, formed the basis of the uh, Islam proficiency of these sciences as uh, Kufti says and now see of course that um, what about the Greek astronomy and geography tradition how did that start out um, about, about the same uh, period in the Abbasi Khalif uh, Mansur uh, was the period uh, when the first translations from uh, Majest, uh, Majest, Majest from uh, Ptolemy, which was uh, translated for the first time. Uh, and three books have been very proficient, the, the books of Aristotle, especially on logic and uh, the medicine issues, and uh, the um, Ptolemy in geometry, and maybe the uh, Euclid uh, works. 
as well it should be added to those three so as i said the fact that this is a very specific technicality and area of expertise and in a world that is for the first time faced with this expertise cannot adopt immediately adapt immediately so there were um, repeated efforts to uh, understand uh, these through different translations and after that Sayyidim uh, al-Harizmi Ebu Hassan Hachash bin Watar Neirizi Sabit Bikura and these are the prominent scholars that have contributed to the translation of uh, Almagest in that sense and um, they have formed uh, geography um, guidelines and of course we are using some sources that have been uh, not very been not been very proficient there for example yakubi and uh, talks about uh, the content of almagest as well how many sections there are how many chapters and it, it goes into the content of already uh, translated uh, books so and mesudi also talks about uh, this uh, uh, having seen this uh, uh, map, well, uh, Fuad says that uh, Ptolemy does not have a map of his own, but uh, Misudi says that I have seen a colored map of it myself. So from here we understand that uh, the uh, translated Almagest contains maps uh, at that time. And of course there is the 8,000 uh, determination of 8,000 geographical points as mentioned by Ptolemy. And uh, we see that uh, among all of these, the Caliph Memun just sitting down and uh, having the scholars carry out such a prominent task which will impact the world of cartography in the futures and uh, there are about 70 uh, scientists uh, which have taken part in this and uh, in this task uh, based on the discussions of the already uh, used um, Indian Greek uh, astronomy uh, tables so test them and I believe that uh, these uh, debates have heated up uh, in the upcoming period and I very interesting I would like to say that those who prepared this uh, map uh, are not people who have represented the uh, Indian uh, Hellenic tradition but the Indian uh, the the uh, Persian uh, Greek but the uh, Hint Indian uh, tradition. So I would like to say that the um, official Abbasid uh, ideology uh, was focused on the uh, Greek uh, structures. So uh, when you see that uh, in the later period, we don't see a Ptolemy-based cartography developing there. And on the, on the opposite side, we have the uh, criticisms and uh, skepticism and the need to compare it with uh, the um, maps of uh, the skies in the other traditions, like the Indian tradition. So two sides have uh, agreed upon the fact that this needs to be put into practice and compared and contrasted in practical terms instead of just in theory and uh, of course uh, in the uh, moderate equatorial um, region of the world to be governed you do need uh, data based on the right maps and correct maps for um, for governmental as well as economical as well as social decisions in, in such a um, in such a society of course uh, they the, the translated works have scales and measurements of their own for example the Indians have their own scales and measurements the Greeks have their own scales and measurements so it was not easy to uh, understand them so they had to be updated on the measurements of mile used by the Arabs at the time so therefore uh, the uh, the caliph developed uh, the uh, measurement of zira and and based on the uh, length of uh, fingers uh, in that sense and and that it was uh, developed and used as a basic measurement metal method of that time as instructed by the caliph memun so uh, it, this shows us how uh, precise the measurements were needed in those times and how um, 
how intent uh, the scientists were on this. And uh, so uh, Kufti explains that uh, Memun uh, called uh, Yahya uh, bin Ebu Mansur uh, to him to, pre to prepare this new map. And with the uh, group of uh, scholars, uh, we know of some prominent ones among them and uh, around a group of 70 scholars uh, from uh, 215 to 218, uh, sorry, it's written wrong here. For three years, with all the equipment they need, um, they worked on this task. And in the meanwhile, Memun passed away himself. And within that time, Yahya bin Ibn Mansur um, also passed away two years after this uh, task started out. So almost all of the scholars that took part in this study wrote their own books, as um, probably after the uh, the cartography work was completed people started uh, using uh, their own calculations their own tables as revised uh, astronomy tables revised zich uh, tables uh, for themselves and i will go into that if i have time left uh, so where was all this uh, study carried out? Who were the astro who were these astronomers? Uh, we have a newly translated a book, uh, the activities of uh, scholars in Central Asia in Baghdad. Uh, it's been a few years, uh, very very recently, uh, and we were faced with certain facts there. Uh, there was some of the things that I had not noticed during my PhD myself. Uh, uh, Memun uh, has these scholars, he has working on uh, these uh, topics and they are uh, coming from um, scientific tradition uh, that was actually focused in uh, the, uh, the Valley of Harism and there is um, it's, which is already prominent in that reason because they need to uh, have a good scientific and engineering background to be able to cope with the tides of the river in that uh, in that region in that plain so they have a good and strong and solid tradition there so Maimun has these uh, uh, scholars being uh, brought there that which are not part of the Hellenic tradition but the uh, Indian Persian uh, tradition and uh, Halid al Merveruzi, Ahmed al Fargani, and Senet B. Ali uh, are among these. Uh, these um, are together with Yahya bin Ibn Mansur coming from the Harism uh, Valley and from that tradition. And a while after they start uh, with uh, coming to uh, to uh, El Memun's uh, city of Bada, they start working on these calculations. How much time do I have left? Okay, on the uh, north, uh, the ish, there is the topic of how these measurements are carried out in the books. There are d descriptions and depictions. The Sinjar Valley is a straight valley. We needed to first find that straight valley to be able to uh, measure the meridian lines. And in Sinjan, uh, there were uh, small hills and uh, the delegation divided into two. Some went north. Uh, and put up um, some signs and some posts to uh, determine the times of the sun and the moon together with an astrolabe. Of course, I haven't been able to really grasp what they are describing there. I have seen some, some pictures of it as well, but I'm not very sure what these actions actually indicate in the tradition of uh, astronomy. But uh, as a result, as a conclusion, I can say that uh, uh, these are um, methodologies that have been used by Aristoteles and Ptolemy as well. And so this book, Kitab uh, al uh, this is uh, something that I found in a bookseller's uh, bookseller in Germany. So this is actually a summary of the tradition of Harezmi in this uh, scientific technology, uh, which is partly describing the techniques used in those times in that tradition and how the world is divided into seven uh, regions of climate, how the latitude, longitude measurements are made, how the uh, astronomical tables are prepared. There is data on that as well. So 
Uh, first of all, these uh, poles and these ropes were used, and, and different measurements were compared and contrasted. So, and uh, we had uh, have come up with a measurement of uh, the latitude uh, of 56 two thirds, and and and they have. Um, um, calculated the radius and uh, so they have as they have come up with 40,253.4 kilometers and today it is calculated as 40,068 uh, kilometers so in that sense of course since then until today uh, the the um, the movement of the plates with the earthquakes have also been uh, uh, effective as well but we see still it is a very similar uh, measurement and precise measurement to what we have today the measurements were taken in, in, the, in the time frame of uh, three years to 215 to 218 some of the measurements continued with individual efforts uh, after the deaths of uh, the Caliph Memun and uh, Yahya bin Abu Mansur and they're coming to uh, Byzantium, uh, actually, and uh, his uh, his grave, his tomb, is in Tarsus, uh, if you're interested. And uh, the zits were uh, prepared in the uh, Badat and Damascus observatories, and uh, the uh, the measurements, it is said, were taken in the valleys of Sinjar, Raqqa, Tedmur, and Kufe. And um, there are small detail about this. It says that uh, this uh, study was tested tested and uh, experienced in different cities of the Islamic world. So apparently the studies started out in Sinjar or went uh, into uh, different studies in Tedmur and Kufa and then in Egypt. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the, this is the information that we can from various sources. And as a result of this, uh, the uh, well-known astronomy tables called Ezijul Mumtehan were prepared and maps were prepared based on these astronomic uh, tables and uh, so the uh, the spherical structure of the uh, of the world uh, the uh, the the positioning of the sun the stars and the planetary bodies and uh, the rotation of the world and the uh, revolution of the world around the sun and these were all based on uh, the uh, this uh, these astronomical tables so this map is a reconstruction of by Fuad Sezgin of course, it's a long work, and uh, also uh, this is a PhD thesis uh, of uh, an Indian scholar in 16, uh, 1960 as well, uh, but I could not reach any visuals uh, that he has made. And um, but I would like to say that in the map of Memun, there are 4,200 geographical points pointed out uh, with mathematical astronomy, uh, with direct determination of latitude and longitude were, uh, were, were determined as cities. And, and in these seven regions, the climate regions, the, the, the, the rivers and landscapes uh, were determined as a basis of these uh, seven climate regions. Of course, the map here is the the, the result of a long-term effort and work, and maybe it was one of the most exciting discoveries for Fuad Sezgin as well. The, the map that I showed you, of course, is not a single uh, a, a, a single parchment. There was 25 different pieces brought together. When you look on the right-hand side, I don't know if you have guessed it, it, get, it is uh, the, the Nile and the Arabian Peninsula and the Red Sea. Um, okay, I'm wrapping up. Uh, after that, of course, uh, Yahya bin Abul Mansur wrote Ezijul Mumtahan, and uh, Habesh al Hasib also uh, wrote another uh, work based on this Ezijul Mumtahan, and he uh, also wrote uh, other uh, similar uh, scholars who were on this commission in this group used the same data to write their own books. And uh, and a significant part of these works have reached today as well. Uh, Yahya Ibu bin Mansur Harizmi's works have reached today, and uh, Kufti actually uh, indicates that 
Yeah, Harizmi and uh, Bin Musa were the basis and the coordinators of this work. And it says that uh, the map of uh, Memun is um, actually a groundbreaking uh, work, and it is in the first uh, quarter of the third to ninth uh, centuries. It uh, gives a cartographic description of humanity in that uh, in the in the globe in those times, and also it is a solid foundation for the later advancement of cartography. I have the determination of uh, the Mecca. And the, um, the the measurement of the distance between cities, more than 4,000 geographical points with latitude and longitude determination. And Africa is uh, stated there. And of course, uh, this is the later periods. And uh, something which is emphasized strongly by Fouad Sezgin also was this. Uh, the picture that you see on the screen is um, uh, the, it's from the Encyclopedia of Omeri. He describes this map uh, in its in his Encyclopedia about 25 years ago. Uh, Fouad Sezgin uh, insistently pointed out that this was the uh, replication of the map of Memun. In, in uh, he states this in all of his works. And also on the right hand side, you can see the map of Idrisi, and uh, this was also inspired by the map of Memun. That's what uh, Fouad Sezgin is saying. This, the spherical world map of Idrisi uh, is all the, uh, the partial or crude replications of uh, the map of El Memun. And this is an example of one of the uh, manuscript Zich astronomy tables. And this is the depiction of various regions in the world, especially in Eastern Africa and in Indian Ocean, the Madagascar region. Uh, draft uh, depictions from the uh, from the map. Thank you very much. Hocam, çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Belki we would like to thank you. We may have some questions, so you can make use of your time if you like. Our distinguished professor was speaking about the Memun map and Memun map and the Caliph. Abbasi Caliphs and the map of uh, Mammon map base has started as an Indian actually version and then it has changed its style, its trend. Any questions related with this topic? The floor is yours, Mustafa Bey. Thank you very much. We have really made use of your presentation a lot. Other than actually Questioning you, I have a wonder. There is an Indian tradition, and when we consider Islam, what type of a uh, relationship we can relate on the religious basis? I do not think that there is a actually a clear cut transformation passing through it. What is being mentioned here actually is not something standard. The language is not something standard. And there are some, of course, issues which are which have been seen far apart is directly related with measurement. 51 centimeter, 52 centimeter, it is so much related with the meter. Um, it is not actually the size of the world or planet Earth. It's not changing. It is not the diameter of the world. Indians and Greek people do have some certain, actually, scaling. We are saying between two meridians. Actually, there is a certain distance, we state. But when we compare, it is essential to compare it the past meridian standard with present meridian standard because the figures in such kind of a situation will be totally different. There is no meter type of actually unit at those times. Actually, yes, those uh, scalings needs to change, needs to be adapted. Uh, when we speak about zero, for example, as a unit, as a meter unit, it is not what we are seeing as a meter today, so that zero and meter difference may differ. Actually, as you all know it very well, in India, in Indus Valley, 
Then in 712, Muhammad bin Qasim brought the Islamic trend. And before that, they were having some communication with this geography, but the Muslim world for the very first time with Masra and Bayleman. They have taken Dar al was the founded city at those times. And above that city, the first communication is taking place, the first relationships are appearing. There are some certain gaps which are filled by Biruni, Zetur Zdirat. So in a, he has got a manuscript, uh, Biruni has got a manuscript, and in his manuscript it is stating how those processes are starting after the concurrent, what type of communications and negotiations they had, and Fezara sect, and they are also pioneering people for how they have communicated with the Indian aristocrats and how they have moved them to the center. Step by step, in detail, being described by Biruni. This is not the, the, our discussion point today, but there is one more point. From Bailaman, they are starting their negotiations. That famous zero number is coming that, and the map books are coming from Ibrahim and Fezari's studies and Ibn Matar's studies. And the first translations uh, during the foundation of Abbasis are starting. And all of the communications and negotiations are getting deeper and continuing. And since we are having a modern centralized European point of view, and we are so much emphasizing the Greek tradition, these main sources, when we go into the depths of these main sources, actually there, there are more rooted and impacting type of issues. And uh, of course, we are having the heritage of Indian civilization this uh, nation is a very big nation and they have founded very important countries and so on and of course with a great appreciation this being mentioned and the aristotle's philosophy and logic has got an impact and the greek uh, heritage is forthcoming i don't want to interrupt you but there may be some people would like to ask questions what i would like to say is me when he made this translation, when we look, is having a very developed level of actually mathematical knowledge. And we are, of course, in uh, need of concerning some certain facts. Islamic scholars, before reaching to Greek and Indian knowledge, there is an actual methodology that they follow. There is a progress in many fields. As long as, as soon as they come across with actually a area, they do have an actual interaction with that field and they are integrating it. Yeah, this is what I wanted to f uh, point out. Islam is between uh, the river Nil and Amudarya. Mavera Nir can also be mentioned. All of the ancient civilizations, rooted civilizations, cities. There is an ecumenic area in Mavera Nir and it is situated, positioned on that. And in the ancient Greek times, we still see some certain, actually, uh, fertile areas and regions and of course regions of fertile crescent is, is being positioned there unofficially of course they have continued their presence without having that basis i cannot have moses fargani or harizmi let me briefly inform you that next month we will complete a phd dissertation about Memnoni, so it will be good. Let's take a question. Let's not repeat the same things. So, and the Rashid maps. And there is another uh, another uh, question. Ju just, just uh, there is a unit stadia. Do you know what is it? No. Because I am Come also looking for it. I am looking for it. For that, I uh, I need to ask you this. Thank you. Hayo yo yok bende yok. Onu anladım da yok. Yok ama zaten onlar da yok. Hiç 
Peki başka bir soru var mı? Any other questions? Nazan Hanım, the floor is yours. Last question, please. Thank you very much. It was a very acknowledging uh, presentation. The reduction of the diameter of the planet, our planet, Earth's planet, is a very important topic, but we need to be a suspicious approach for that. The radius, the radius of the world has reduced. In 20 years ago, we have had a, an earthquake in Aegean Sea, and uh, the TV um, journalist has just appeared on the scene and said there is a three meter of a shift to the Greek side. If uh, each earthquake reduces the distance between two countries in a longer period of time, of course, this can be bigger than we can assume, we can presume and the size and the meter can be the same for today. When we are updating it, we need to compare and contrast the metric values. Yes, that can be a possibility. We have got one more presentation, so I need to stop you. Yes, we can speak it outside also. There is an earth, uh, actually, centric and also solar centric approaches. As you all know it very well, uh, one centimeter or one millimeter of a shift in the real area, in the real space, is uh, totally can be bigger than what we assume. Actually, they they can be close also for more when it goes to forty thousands, for example. Biruni, once more, we need to remind Biruni once more. And Biruni is all Biruni is extracting some arcs, for example, and about the actually uh, errors. He is extracting the errors and he is uh, amending the declinative errors. A positive science scholar is so much attentive, and uh, of course, it is so much related with the perception of the world, the planet, and in Muslim world, the, the Biruni's approach is being accepted. But there is also uh, some speculation, Zekiarazi, Biruni, oh, and Copernicus, for example, uh, has been questioned by the Islamic world, since that we do have an Earth-centric type of universe design, if the world is evolving, our Earth is evolving around the Sun, you need to have, of course, a skeptic approach. There are the technical sides and needs to be analyzed from the technical perspective. Okay, thank you very much. We need to conclude this speech. It was a very uh, productive uh, speech. Okay, our last speaker. Let's move to our last speaker. Ravda El Haji. She's going to speak about Suleiman and Mahri's Al Umda Al Mahriya Fidat Al Um Bahriya work. And she's going to speak about the Indian Ocean navigations. Is your presentation in English or in Arabic? In Turkish? Ya duymuyoruz değil mi? Bizim uh, please, please open your mic. Kusura bakma. <gülüyor> okay. Evet, merhaba hocam. Okay, merhaba. Ee, şey İngilizce olacak. Uh, okay. Tamam. Now you have you have 20 minutes only, okay? Tamam hocam. 20 minutes is good, is enough. <gülüyor> okay. <gülüyor> tamam. Um, it is with great honor and privilege to present to you my work and his book entitled al al Mahriya fi Dabta Al-Ulum Al-Bahriya. Allow me to give you a brief introduction to the history of navigation. As centuries entered the Indian Ocean, indigenous people such as the Indians, Chinese, Malays, Persians and Arabs were already dominating prevalently the ocean surface, providing naval and commercial fleets. So from mid 7th century to the 15th, Islamic civilization continued to expand towards the four points of the compass. The occurrence of sea trade between the Persian Gulf and China was made possible by this simultaneous existence of large empires, both, uh, both at uh, the end of the route. The sea route from the Persian Gulf to Canton was the longest in regular use by, by mankind before the European expansion. because the uh, ancient texts are currently lacking, 
But as a result of the discovery made by in 1883, two very important 2020-92 and 2059 in the National Library of Paris were found. These manuscripts served as a window to great discoveries and knowledge I'd heard by the last two inheritors of the art of navigation, Ahmed ibn Majid and Suleyman al-Mahri. Now, these catalogues reflect the extensive contributions realized in the turn of the, fifth, of the 15th and the early 16th century. The works of these two navigators, especially those of Suleyman al-Mahri, were also the sources that played the fundamental part in the writing of al-Muhid. This exceptional systematic book written by Sidi Ali Rais, founded after a long hunt and research on nautical instructions from the sailors among his crew, and whose main cause for his presence in the Indian Ocean is to expel the Portuguese who sought full control of the strategic fulcrum of the port cities in the early 16th century. During the lifetime of Suleiman al-Mahri, the Portuguese rounded the Cape and quickly established themselves on the coast of East Africa and Western India, both key regions in the Indian Ocean trading network. Suleiman bin Ahmed bin Suleiman al-Mahri, the younger successor of Ibn Majid, known as the Muallim of the Indian Ocean and the second representative of navigational geography, was born in 1480 and was originally from Southern Arabian Mahara and a native of Shehir, which is a coastal town in modern-day Yemen, according to the Turkish Admiral Sidi Ali. The scholars' nautical instructions which have reached us contain no biographical information, yet Sidi Ali reported that al-Mahri was already dead by the time he wrote his treatise al-Muhid in 1553. As for uh, the nautical treatises authored by the navigators Ahmed ibn Majid, Suleyman al-Mahri, and their successor Sidi Ali, were accounted for their application of two basic approaches, the theoretical Nazari and empirical Tajribi that made them the authority in the field of medieval nautical science and Indian oceanic navigation. These two basic approaches are considered as the nature of science of navigation, referred to by the term Asl al-Ilm. Suleyman al-Mahri authored several, several treatises, and some of his works that have reached us are Qiladat al-Shumus wa istikharaj qawaid al-Usus, al-Minhaj al-Fakhir fi ilm al-Bahar al-Zakhir, Tuhfat al-Fuhul fi tamhid al-Usul, Sharh Tuhfat al-Fuhul fi tamhid al-Usul, and al-Umda al-Mahriya fi dabt al-Ulum al-Bahriya. Al-Umda is regarded as one of the most concise and clear treaties of all the works produced in the field of navigational science. This treatise is divided into several chapters. Some of the main theoretical headings approaches the basis of nautical astronomy and there are several sections dealing with the form of the heavenly stars and gave brief theoretical introduction of the angular measurements used in stellar navigation. Hence, the most distinct progress that shaped their study is the accurate determinations composed and arranged and their theory followed by practical results. The nautical knowledge founded under these developments and measurements have come to be regarded as a science that embraces and encompasses different disciplines, such as geography, astronomy, mathematics, and meteorology, which ultimately led to the rationalization of navigation into a science, which they refer to by the term Ilm al-Bahr. Until now, there is no translation of the treatise al-Umda, which was originally intended to be one of the last volumes of nautical instruction, Arab and Portuguese route of the 15th and 16th century published by Ferron. Unfortunately, he only made it to the third volume, whereas the rest were available in printed forms. Therefore, that was one of the main reasons that I addressed this subject and translation during my master's as my purpose and goal. And goal. Allow me here to give you a brief background on Suleyman al-Mahri's work, Al-Umda al-Mahriya fi Dabta al-Ulum al-Bahriya. This treatise is divided into seven chapters, Bab, each of which are divided into, se into sections, Fasl, and Principles Usul. Suleyman al-Mahri's comment in the first chapter clearly show the growth of the corpus of the astronomical and nautical knowledge attained in the Islamic world rather well melding the empirical knowledge accumulated by experienced seafarers with his own scientific investigation, important elements in the text, such as star altitude measurement and the compass bearings, 
performed by latitude and longitudinal measurements were the subjects that enabled a route to be laid down. With that being said, according to Professor Seskin, Suleiman presents everything necessary for the compilation of accurate charts. His list of places using two units of length, Terfa and Zam, to measure distances on sea covers almost all the frequented areas of the Indian Ocean. The second chapter characterizes the efficiency of the practical side of Al-Mahri's books as a source of seeking experience for the learned man. This section includes the names of the 15 essential stars for a navigator to access when sailing in the open sea of the Indian Ocean. In describing the qualities required by a navigator, on the other hand, Suleyman al-Mahri stated, uh, stated the following conditions. So for the navigator to be proficient in the theory of knowing the route, calculating latitude and longitudinal measurement, shall retain knowledge over the use of the compass, to know the route he is sailing, to follow the right seasons, and to be adept to the management and the insight of the boat, which he refers to by Siasat wa Madarat al-Markab. Thus, intellect and experience are the basic qualities required by a navigator, each of which are either dependent or independent from each other. Chapter 3 discusses this is the description of the coast and islands under and above the winds. The former under the winds refers to the coasts and islands of the west and east of the Cape Comorin and China, and the latter refers to the west of the Cape of Comorin. Now, these descriptions were given by means of compass bearings preceded by relevant theory. This chapter is divided into seven sections describing different routes, such as the Red Sea, the northwest coast of India, the east coast of Africa from Bab el Mandeb, the southern Arabian coast to Socotra, and uh, the eastern coast of India, the Malay Peninsula, and the coast of Indochina and Western China. In the fourth chapter, Suleiman carries on with the description of the route, focusing only on certain islands, such as the islands of Madagascar, Comoros, Archipelago Socotra, Maldives, and Ceylon. Grosse Gronsch came to the conclusion that none of the two great navigators had visited Madagascar, which, all, which was also quoted by Sezgin. He had the impression that Suleiman did not even know the coast of East Africa directly. He assumed that the Mu'allims had access to maps of extraordinary quality in the Islamic world. It is a discussion that formed a conclusion over the positions of these data and graduated maps being composed from earlier generations, collected and originated by the last two navigators, Suleyman al-Mahri and Ibn Majid, and were questioned and later corrected. In the following chapter, Suleyman al-Mahri discusses the science of taking latitude of the principal ports, such as that of the Red Sea, the Eastern Arabian coast, by measuring the stellar altitude, which they refer to by the, uh, by the term Qiyas, and introduces the traditional musical instrument Kamal, which he refers to by the term Khashaba. He dealt with it as a basic instrument and provided additional information about its utilization. The type of Kamal that Suleyman al-Mahri addresses is of several wooden plates of different sizes. This type was referred to by Sayyidi Ali as Alet. Suleyman ended this chapter by discussing the Bashi of the 28 lunar mansions. The knowledge of the Bashi values were all, for all the lunar mansions was regarded as essential. It was the measurement of how far the pole star was above its measurements at lower culmination. And they varied from zero at the lowest position when Polaris it, uh, is at the exact same altitude as the uh, celestial pole, hence zero Bashi, to four Isba when the star is at its maximum position at the same meridian of the observer. On the other hand, a lunar mansion is often used as part of their calendar system. The nautical calendar system they operated with used the per uh, Persian Nairos. This brings us to the sixth chapter where Suleiman spoke in depth on the monsoons of the Indian Ocean. In these nautical works by Ibn Majid and Suleiman al-Mahri, the term mousing refers to the sailing season, that is, the ideal time to set sail to a specific destination from a specific port. 
The author spoke of miscellaneous seasons for approaching certain ports, mainly the southwest monsoon, which they refer to by Riha Dabur or Al Kaus, and it rains from April to September, and the northeast monsoon, which they refer to by the two terms Riha Al Kabul or Al Azib, Al -Azib which uh, prevails to March. With that being said, this chapter offers a list of seasons for the major for the major ports in the Indian Ocean trading network. The closure of the seas, on the other hand, is the season when navigation stops and where the vessels were fitted out. So overall, besides astronomical charts and measurements, these manuals possess information about every important element a captain would need to know. One of the elements that progressed to a branch of navigational science is isharat. As sailing the Indian Ocean requires celestial navigation, the usage of other techniques were not excluded. Thus, in daytime and during poor weather, other expertise would replace the sailor's astronomical skills. So these expertise were the detailed knowledge over signs and landmarks, such as sea animals, color and depth of the water, the wind breeze, the waves, willow pools, and tide, among others. Here, the author concludes his book dealing with several sets of voyages accompanied with directions encompassing the whole Indian Ocean, including the islands and islets off the Arabian and African coasts of the Red Sea, followed by detailed routes of some regions such as Malabar, Aden, and Jeddah. Suleyman so al-Mahri ends his treaties by mentioning the dangers a navigator might encounter and the dangers he ought to avoid in certain places and seasons. In, in conclusion, so all the text during that period comprises the necessary information for the coastal navigation, both islands and mainland coasts, and several detailed routes that are remarkably accurate. This position display in inter-oceanic maritime sailing, given their latitude in form of star altitude or their compass bearings from eastern coast of Africa stretching across the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Great Archipelago of Asia. So the written signs of navigation transmitted to us by one of the main inheritors, the, Mu the Mu'allim Suleyman al-Mahri, offers the essential of the nautical instructions practiced in the Indian Ocean and the nautical science undertaken at the beginning of the 16th century. A work, according to Professor Sezgin, features the cartographic techniques gained through the centuries from generation to another. Suleyman al-Mahri shows a great form of practical writing by reducing theory, and focusing more on devoting his work for more concise results. More importantly, the most improved measurements achieved by Suleyman al-Mahri, other than the latitude determination according to Professor Sizgin, is the determination of distances, which is the longitudinal differences in latitude between two points. So throughout history, the latitude were attained by measuring an angle between the polaris and the horizon with the usage of a measuring device. However, longitude, longitude measurements were not easy to achieve, which allowed the application of trigonometric methods. And these developments were to be found in Suleyman al-Mahri's works. So the determinations covered the distances of the entire Indian Ocean, as I mentioned before, and the uh, African Peninsula. And consequently, this method served as the key for the history of cartography and mathematical geography. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and um, um, Ms. Rauda uh, has uh, talked to us about uh, one of the uh, students of Anad Mahri and uh, the works of uh, Suleyman Al Mahri. Um, uh, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much, uh, and congratulations. I have two questions. I 
Do you have also emphasized uh, these points? Uh, I was going to ask about Ibn Majid uh, and uh, about in terms of the relationships with the Portuguese. Uh, are there any mention of a map uh, called the Catalan uh, map? Uh, because that is a map that is said that uh, Portuguese were taken from the uh, Indian uh, plain uh, map. And um, you said that all the um, materials necessary for making a map, uh, the measurements, the tables are already uh, present with Suleiman al uh, Do you uh, have you come across anything of like maps uh, in the in the region? Suleiman al he did not mention of any map, especially in al-umda al fi al ulum al and I only worked on his the theory parts of his book. However. Uh, inshallah, during my PhD, this, uh, my PhD project, I intend to work on recreating the Indian Ocean based on his uh, on his uh, measurement, the latitude and longitudinal measurements. Mm -hmm. So, to answer your question, during my masters, I did not work on any map, but during my PhD project, I intend to work on such thing to recreate it. Peki, herhangi bir e, kadeva çizimi var mı? Yani haritaya dönük altlık çizimi var mı? Is there any canvas measurements uh, for for the map? Okay, thank you. Başka sorumuz var mı? Okay, any questions? Any other questions? A small remark for you. Uh, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. You think Saudi Arabia is not a good for this wonderful presentation? I think that because at that time there uh, was no a country named Saudi Arabia. He was originally Hocam, from Socatra. Saudi Arabia, so you Arabian coast. I did not say Saudi Arabia. I said Arabian coast. So. Okay, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome, Hocam. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, yes, do you have a question? المهري ممكن أن يكون من اليمن أو ممكن أن يكون من عمان. Actually, that they are the navigators before the Islam times, and there are very huge numbers about that Kabyle. And they were going to India before Islam. They were in Iraq. They were going to Oman, and Oman to Yemen. They were moving those. Are all those mariners, those sailors, are all coming from the same sect, the same Kabyle? Uh, we have listened to a very fruitful, actually, presentation. It was very contributing. I would like to thank each of our speakers for their contribution. I would like to thank Hope. We will have an opportunity to read them in detail. As you all know, this one was being published, and most probably the second one will also be published. And I would like to thank them. And, uh, of course, biggest thank will be going to you, our distinguished audience, because you have allocated your valuable time and you have honored this session. And I would like to thank everyone for their patience. And I'm closing the 15th session.
to open the closing session, I would like to invite our rector, Mahmutak, as the session chair. Professor Dr. Zekir Yakushan, Professor Dr. Mustafa Kaçar, Zayda Özkan Rüşet, and Jean Paul Vernik are also invited to the floor, to the head table. Distinguished participants, distinguished colleagues, distinguished teachers, scholars of history of science in Islam, and the lucky people who have come across and who have entered with Professor Dr. Fuad Sizgin. I would like to salute you all with a great respect. We have come to the end of a very important event. We have started this journey under the auspices of the professor and decided to carry it on two weeks. Istanbul University and uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakıf University and with our foundation, Itam Foundation, and we have got a commitment to carry on. We do have contributors and, of course, the biggest contributing institution and is our ministry, our Ministry of Culture. Starting from our minister and also provincial director of tourism affairs and all of the staff of this ministry, we would like to thank them because they have had great contribution to real. And when we were carrying on our event, we were having Eskidar municipality support and Fatih municipality support. I would like to thank our mayor Hilmi Turkman and Ergun Turan on behalf of our participants. On the other side, this is an invitation named as Symposium. And if you do not have the participants, actually, who accept our invitation, we cannot achieve it. We cannot realize it. And you, distinguished scholars, who have accepted our invitation from, my, from the deepest part of my heart, I would like to thank you. Each paper do have a great attempt to be presented and do have a great, of course, process to be presented. And distinguished researchers and scholars, I would like to thank you. As you all know it very well, we have had 68 papers presented between from 12 different countries, and 51 of them were physically present. Only two of them could not attend. 49 active participation could be achieved and the other of course guests have been hosted with a hybrid technology and presented their papers i would like to thank active participants once more for joining us now our closing session speakers once more i would like to thank you but I also would like to point. When this symposium idea appeared, it was proposed to make it every other two years. And let's keep it national, they have said. But we wanted to make it international. And if the conditions allows us, in 2023, we will do the symposium once more. The time and the framework of symposium is important here. When will it be? And what will be the framework and the main team? and by the honorary committee and then for the new symposium we will open our call one more thing that i would like to emphasize before concluding my speech this unity this collaboration should not actually be waiting should not be waited for two years there may be a lot of colleagues 
who have gathered and seen and have an opportunity to become familiar with each other. And other than the followers of each speaker, they have had an opportunity to present their thoughts and opinions to each other. So we can create more benefit than we assume. All of these studies will not stay in the oral presentations, but they will be also transformed into scientific articles. We may do that as Istanbul University. We have got 55 academic publications, and 38 of them are in Turkish index and SSI, uh, of course, journals. And the research center's journal may also be included among these journals. Well, you can send your papers to one of our journals, and you can go and uh, also make a closer examination to our Islamic Studies journal and our university publication house is an international publication house. In Europe, and we are following it very closely. As a result of this, it, it will be possible to be scanned in web of science. Why am I telling this? This present audience so the wide audience which they may address may place forth some certain issues about history of science and they may also publish independent books let's not leave it two year after let's uh, make this collaboration more i'm speaking on behalf of two universities and i'm community, fruitful audience who are ready to uh, cooperate. The third one, we should not wait for the third symposium. We may create better grounds, better platforms. Under the pioneership of our foundation, we can take actions. We are ready as the university. We are volunteering to support your attempts. So, other than this symposium title, this committee creates collaborative works. I would like to remind you this. And as you all know it very well, the translation of our professor's works will be published soon. Four of the volumes have already been published. Fifteen of the volumes have been uh, in the progress of publication. The last two volumes, translation and the editing proofreading process was completed. And very soon, the whole series of his publications will be published with a translated edition without in the Islamic Researchers Centers. And under the title of Islamic Researchers Centers, uh, we, it is going to move to an independent building. It, it has got a place and with his books, with his research hall and also library and with its rooms. In collaboration with Islamic Economy and Research Centers, we will join our forces. Islam is, it was Islamic researchers uh, actually journal before. Now it has become Islamic Tetkik journal. So it has been transformed into an international journal. And we are trying to provide international opportunities for our studies, for our works. And once more, I would like to thank for your participation. I would like to thank everyone who have provided us this opportunity. We can collaborate more, we can cooperate more and open to any type of recommendation, any type of proposal. Once more, I would like to repeat this. And also, I would like to commemorate Professor Dr. Sezgin and also hope that his wife 
will be having a healthy life from now on. And unfortunately, foundation had the foundation chair's mother passed away, so we would like to send our praise for his mother. Let me start from the right side. What are your aspirations? What are your thoughts? Esteemed Chair, esteemed Director, thank you very much. I would actually like to say that uh, this conference showing us uh, what kind of a horizon could be awaiting us and uh, what kind of uh, activities we could have in the future. Uh, and your enlightening words also to that end uh, are um, uh, very uh, important to us. And I would also like to say on behalf of the Fadi Sultan Mehmet Vakuf University, in this conference, I would like to say that uh, we are very happy to be here as a partner, and I would like to thank you for your hospitality in and hosting this uh, event. And uh, you have already uh, thanked and commemorated uh, all the uh, other authorities on our behalf of all of us. But on my own behalf, on behalf of my own university, I would like to just reiterate those. Thanks, of course. Uh, what are the, the aspirations and hopes of the late Fat says Gin seems to have been, uh, uh, seems to have come to life uh, in the aftermath, in the heritage that he has left us, in the legacy that he has left us with his works and um, uh, with his uh, uh, instruments. So this shows that under whichever conditions, if someone focuses on a goal, on an aim, as the late professor had always pointed out in his um, speeches and in his interviews, in spite of all the negativities, uh, there will always uh, be positive uh, outcomes and positive results. And and what we see uh, from his life and uh, as we organize the second of the international symposiums which we are organizing in his honor indicates this for us and one of his greatest legacies is that he has uh, enabled uh, the history of science and islam to become um, uh, the part of the university uh, studies and it has actually uh, been initiated in the Istanbul University, but through a um, mistaken decision, it was it had been barred as history of science. But then, uh, again, uh, with the um, help and the guidance of our late professor, uh, again, uh, a chair of uh, the history of sciences was formed at the university, which was. Uh, uh, supported uh, by his uh, activities and background. Uh, I would like to point out that we have uh, accepted and adopted this legacy as the Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakuf University. And I think Kastamon University is the third university to have a, a history of sciences uh, department and also Medinet University. OK, so in a few universities now, we see that uh, their, uh, this, this department is active and that they have also adopted this legacy legacy and, um, and paving the way for new uh, fields like the uh, uh, philosophy of sciences as well. And uh, we need to be active on that front as well. And although it is a universal topic, we know that local conditions and local political and economical social conditions can change the context. And uh, science, just like water, flows into the favorable areas and favorable contexts. So um, due to maybe um, due if, if not for the university reforms in Turkey, if, the, if not for the late professor, and all these, um, this knowledge could have flown to another favorable condition. And in that sense, and in, in an age when he became an associate professor and a professor, and um, the the unfortunate political events and coup d'etat that was experienced, uh, if he had not left the country as a result of that unfortunate development, maybe all the development uh, in our country could have been much more different as well. And of course, uh, as we know, 
And uh, we have here the final declarations of the first symposium as well, print, published as a book. And we know that the activities in our own universities, the the the, the we see that now uh, the, the water has flown into this context uh, in, our, in our country as well, because you know um, it is the history of science seems to be actually a sub. Uh, topic of history but you know uh, you know this um, topic actually being taken in hand within the context of science rather than history is actually what is giving me hope in this symposium and I do believe that there have been very significant speeches and papers by academicians who are very well aware of uh, the significance of the issues. And rather than just historical recital um, based on experimentation and figures and methodologies, and uh, this gives us hope as Fatih Sultan Mehmet University, and we are ready to uh, cooperate in any and all sense with our um, stakeholders and our partners in this project as much as we are able to. And this thrilling and exciting journey of the, of the ship of the history of uh, sciences uh, into uh, the uh, wide ocean. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity once again to uh, thank Istanbul University uh, and the rector uh, and all of the university staff and academicians and all the unsung heroes on the backstage whom we have never seen or the interpreters or translators uh, whom we have not uh, seen. Um, I would like to thank them all and um, and my words with this. Thank you very much, Serge. And the next speaker. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to make some remarks. I apologize for the fact that I do not speak Turkish. So this has been a very wonderful symposium for uh, many reasons. Uh, for me, the first reason is, of course, that it continues the heritage of Fuat Sesgin. But also, at the same time, uh, it takes it one step further. Uh, let me share you some interesting memories uh, of Professor Seskin with you. So as uh, I told you, I met Professor Seskin when I was a young boy of 23 years old. I had read his Geschichte des Arabischen Schrifttums, and I was a very uh, adventurous young man, so I didn't have any hesitations. I just dialed the telephone number, and there he was on the phone. So I explained what I was doing, and he said, yes, why don't you come? So uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, uh, characteristics of Professor Seskin was his hospitality. I mean, he has, uh, in his institute, he had apartments where scholars could stay, and also, um, uh, when I wanted to come, uh, he would always say, yes, uh, you can come. Uh, also, if I wanted to take other people with me, such as uh, Mr. van Gent, who is in the back uh, seat, Mr. de Graaf and Mr. Hietbrink, they were always welcome. So he was very much always uh, extending to uh, the rest of the world, but at the same time, he was so busy with his uh, Geschichte des Arabischen Schrifttums and his projects that he did not really have time to invest in this uh, activity. And so once I remember, um, I had taught uh, a course on history of Islamic science at Utrecht University. And this is only four hours by train from Frankfurt. So I thought, why don't we go to Professor Seskin, to visit Professor Seskin with the whole group? And of course, he immediately agreed. And so we went there with this group of 20 students to spend uh, two, two days there. And then when it turned out that there was not enough place for them to stay, he paid their hotel. I mean, next to his institute, there is a hotel. And he then told me, you have done something which I, have, which I could not do because of my activities. You are sharing this with this group of people. So this is something which he very much wanted, but which he did not have uh, the opportunity to do this for, for obvious reasons, because he had to restrict his uh, energies. And so this is now something which I'm very glad that Istanbul University and Fatih Sultan Mehmet universities and the other universities are trying to do. And in this way, they also continue the heritage of Professor Seskin. Then, um, on this uh, symposium itself, 
it has been very interesting to participate and to see that uh, two things uh, in this symposium were very special. First of all, that there was successful hybrid participation, so people from other countries who could not be here could also participate, that is one. And second, something which is really very special is the simultaneous translation. I mean, I remember from the conferences in other countries that usually they do not do this. Uh, once I was in Iran, then they were doing it in English. But here you were doing it in two languages. So really it makes it possible for uh, people from three different uh, cultural areas to contribute, namely from Turkey, of course, uh, from the Arab world, and from uh, the Western world. So the language can never be a barrier for communication. Uh, this also, this fits in with Professor Seskin's uh, uh, story that he always uh, insisted that we learn languages. So he also told me that I had to learn languages. At that time, Russian Orientalists were publishing very valuable work. So he told me, you have to learn Russian, you have to learn Russian. So. I took a course, Russian for reading, for just to read it. I mean, one doesn't need to speak it. So, but so also by bringing all these languages together, you are uh, doing something to uh, continue the heritage of Professor Seskin. And of course, as I uh, say, for you, Istanbul is normal. You are in Istanbul, right? So it, it, Istanbul is a normal world. For us, this is not at all the case. Because Istanbul is really the main uh, city where the heritage of Islamic science continues because uh, from Samarkand, uh, from the 14th and 15th century, there is a direct line of Ulugberg and al Kashi, etc. So also the manuscripts from there went to here. So this is really the main treasure trove of the world uh, in terms of manuscripts. Of course, there are other places like Tehran and Cairo and also in my country, Leiden, but Istanbul is the most important. So therefore, it's also very good and very satisfying to have these activities in Istanbul, which already has the material remains so that it also continues the, uh, the, the, the study of this. And I think I didn't mention this yet, but I want to close with um, my final observation. There are, uh, were very talented young people here. I mean, it's of course good to have uh, talks by established scholars, but it is uh, also good and maybe even better to have talks by young people. And I was very pleased to attend some very high quality talks by young people. So this shows that uh, there is a future to this uh, field. So I would like to leave it at that. Again, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful opportunity. O kadar değerli. It is very important and such kind of symposiums are bringing these opportunities by bringing us different departments. We were able to hear
Kaçar hocamız e, bitirelim. Kendisi e, bir very important name. Istanbul University. He has had a great contribution for the development of Istanbul University. So, ready for your opinions. Thank you very much, distinguished rector, distinguished dean, and distinguished speakers, participants, and the ones who are participating this closing session. I salute you with a great respect. Today, there are two honors that I would like to share with you. I'm very happy. I'm very honored. I'm actually feeling very well. We have realized a second symposium, second international professor Dr. Fuad Sezgin symposium on the history of science in Islam. And my second happiness is seeing the publication of the first symposium. We were able to distribute it to our participants, and we were able to send it to the presenters of each papers. Those two honors do have team effect in the background at the backstage. Istanbul University, as my rector has just mentioned a few minutes ago, I have entered this university as a student, and I have graduated as a professor. For 30 years, I have worked for Istanbul University. And after that, with the initiative and uh, under the auspices of Professor Dr. Fuad Sezgin, we were able to establish the Department of History of Science in Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakıf University. Of course. Islamic Sciences Research Foundation and also institutes, museums, and many other contributors. With their support, we, we could realize this symposium. We could achieve what we have achieved today. So we have provided the continuity of Professor Sezgin's mission. I know in Anatolia, I have visited many cities, and when I was trying to tell his mission, the feedbacks, the reactions that we were taking were hope-giving, and for the future, they're all promising. And what I would like to mention here is as follows. Professor Seskin has got two layers to be understood, one of them is uh, actually academical studies within a disciplinary attitude and also distributing his studies to the wide audience to the whole world. Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakıf University is carrying on this mission with these ideas in mind with my colleagues we are actually aiming to reach and fulfill what he has dreamed about. Is Fuad Sezgin always insisted the understanding, the Western understanding of history of science somehow should shift its paradigm and the deserved space for the history of science in Islam should be opened and the dark age of European era on one side, on the other side, there was the golden age of Islamic world at the same time, simultaneously at the same time. So we should place it and position it in its uh, appropriate and accurate place. I would like to mention that just like the first symposium, we will publish these papers, the presented papers, and then it will be distributed to a broader community. 
On the topic of history of science, of course, as I mentioned in my opening speech, the analysis we made indicate that um, in recent years there has been an um, uh, quite a significant uh, preference and development um, for um, cooperation uh, and uh, the use of technology and the current technologies of uh, communication and uh, information uh, needs to be used more and more. And in this process of the pandemic, throughout the pandemic, we see that some new standards, some new rom normals, norms are, uh, are appearing. And, and this uh, also uh, has shown us throughout this period that uh, remote access and remote communication can be very effective. And this has given us the chance to have may maybe global uh, organizations and global contacts um, uh, remotely. This should be um, taken advantage of. But uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, the libraries, uh, which are very rich in um, the manuscripts of the Islamic world uh, also need to be made accessible. And to be able to do that, uh, we need to have these works uh, translated and uh, edited and uh, turned into something that is uh, understandable by the readers today. In that sense, I would like to commemorate uh, Professor Attila Birj and uh, because if our considering that our uh, our our books and the works of the scientific um, community and the topic of history of science uh, needs to take part in the curriculum. Uh, to be able to do that, we need to uh, so um, have um, a language that is understandable, contemporary, uh, where from which samples and examples can be taken for course books of all levels of education. And that way, the mission of uh, Fuad Sezgin um, turning science into a source of inspiration for the next generations could be achieved in a much more swifter and a much more broader context. Uh, I would like to refrain from taking too much of your time. And I would like to uh, once again thank everyone who have contributed uh, to the symposium, uh, starting with Professor Dr. Junaid Kaya and his team, as well as the uh, Fais Sultan Mehmet Vakuf University students. And um, of course, here's uh, our uh, translation interpretation team who has enabled our communication between all parties throughout the symposium. And hopefully, we will be uh, able to have the chance to organize the third of these symposiums. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. And so the, where there was a final comments. And uh, so until we meet in our third symposium, I would like to wish you all uh, days full of self, uh, health and uh, well-being as well in these difficult times. And hopefully, uh, we will all be safe and sound until the next symposium. Maybe we can now have a photograph uh, session, a photo session with everyone here before the stage.